Welcome to March's planning committee meeting. I'm going to ask, hand over to Maura now to see if Maura can take us to the roll call. Thank you, Chair. Members are hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the planning committee held remotely on Wednesday, the 3rd of March, 2021. Councillor Jason Barr. Councillor Jason Barr. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. Afternoon, yeah, I'm here. Thank, Thank you, you, John. Alderman Alan Breslin. Here. Thank you, Alan. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Here, Maura. Thanks, Angela. Councillor Paul Gallagher. I'm sure. Thank you. Councillor Sean Harkin. Here. Thank you, Sean. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Sure. Councillor Dan Kelly. Yeah, Maura. Thank you, Dan. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. Um, Alderman Hillary McClintock. Here, Maura. Thank you, Hillary. Councillor Kieran McGuire. Here, Maura. Thanks, Kieran. Councillor Philip McKinney. Here, Maura. Thanks, Philip. Councillor Aileen Mellon. And Shaw, Maura. Thank you, Aileen. Councillor Sean Money. Here, Maura. That's great. That's full attendance, Chair. Thank you. Tomorrow, thanks, members. Um, item three is the statement for remote meetings. So I'd like to remind everyone who's in remote attendance that this meeting will be broadcast live via Council's YouTube channel and will be available for the public and media. The broadcast will also be available for repeated viewing at a later date. The broadcast may be the may be terminated or suspended in accordance with Council protocol. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics Amazon while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting to be informed and to the use and storage of these images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making these records available to the public. A copy of the Council's privacy notice may be found on the Council website. Members, um, item four is declarations of members' interests. Um, is there any interest to be, to, to be declared for the items on today's agenda? No. Um, if there's any interests arise um, during the business of today, um, can you indicate and let us know? Members, under chairperson's business, there's a, there's a few um, items of business that I want to um, draw your attention to. The first one is um, in relation to a slight error um, in the in our agenda. Item number item thirteen, the Edmonton DFA consultation is down as open for information or open for information. Yeah, um, there's. I'm going to move that. That requires a decision, so that's um, moved out of infor information, and it, it will require a decision when we get to that. Um, members, in relation to the applications that are in front of us today, item six, um, I've been contacted by the. Um, I've been contacted in relation to that application, um, Judy exceptional per personal circumstances um there was a request to defer that application which after um a discussion with myself and the head of planning um we've we've agreed that that item item will be de de deferred so item six on the agenda will not be here today um i'm going to hand over now to mora and mora is going to take us through the late items Thank you, Chair. Members, you will have received already um, a number of late items um, yesterday via the admin team. 
Um, so I just want to draw your attention to those in summary. Firstly, in terms of item one, we have um, the application at Cluny Road Call Roundabout. We've received a substantial amount of information only um, yesterday, members, in regard to this application, including um, a revised proposal, um, which um, I have to say, members, officers will need to review, and we will also need to consider um, time um, to be given to potential um, comments or um, further objections. So. We need to um, take that and review the, the, the information that has only recently been submitted, unfortunately. Um, so, members, there was a list of various detailed issues there that I would have required you to look at, but given the circumstances, I have no option but to withdraw the application and return the application as soon as we possibly can and uh, due process carried out in advance. Um, so that's item one. Um, in terms of item three, members, we have received a letter of support from the Theatres Trust, and that was received on the 2nd of March again yesterday. And that would be in your uh, emails that you would receive for late items. In terms of item eight, which is an application in Coldog Road. Um, just to be aware that we've received um, a site location plan reviewed um, and recently submitted by the agent and that was received on the 1st of March. And also members, you will have also been sent from ourselves um, an addendum in terms of the report for item two, because we received more detailed conditions um, following the PSD drawings um, from road service. So we've, we've sent that in advance as well to give members an opportunity um, to go through that, but we will also Go through this in detail in the presentation for that item. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Maura. Um, and members, and you'll, we, we've got into the practice now, so you'll be more than familiar um, that when we are when we approach each of those items, um, we will take the appropriate amount of time to consider the information that's been supplied. But Members, just in relation to um, Morris touched on it, um, the first application that's up today um, has been refused or, or has been withdrawn from the, the schedule of today's meeting because there has been late information that needs to be considered. Members, I know that from reading the report, you'll have and, and it's been present, it's been scheduled for a meeting in this of this committee before. Um, Members will note that there have been various changes to that um, that particular application, and it has um, it has been pulled from the schedule in a previous um, a previous committee meeting. So, I, I um, want I, I just want to reassure members that um, after discussion with officers, that that application will be brought back to the committee as soon as possible. Um, so. Whenever, uh, when it, whenever we can bring that commodity, that decision or that application back for decision, then we will do. Um, members, I'm, go I'm going to ask Maura again to come on on um, correspondence we've received from Angus Care in relation to um, the planning portal. Thank and you, the members Chair. have raised, raised issues in, in the past and they'll listen to that. Yeah, members raised issues in January in regard to certain aspects of the portal and there was other concerns as well operationally that staff were, were managing. And you can see that I wrote to um, the chief uh, planner on the 8th, sorry, the 4th of February and we got a response on the 25th of February. That was circulated to yourselves and um, Quite a detailed letter explaining the, the difficulties in regard to the updates and upgrades and the impact that it's had across the, the region. Um, and we've had some more detail in regard to the problems that emerged in certain dates that I had highlighted, which were a concern in terms of the operation of business. 
Um, you will see that they are planning a new upgrade again, and we will be notified um, in advance. So I will let members know in regard to that and update them when that happens. And also you will see from the letter that you've been um, advised that if there's any difficulties at all with public access, that we can identify those problems and at least record them um, so that the department's digital services branch can take into account some of those issues. So I just wanted to highlight that, Chair, um, just to let members know that that will circulate it and we did get a response. Thank you. Thanks, Mara. Members, any comments on that? Are we content to note the, the, the contents of the response? Okay. Um, and very briefly, members, I'm going to bring Mara in again. Um, in relation to the review of the legislation and the call for evidence. And Maura, while you're in, um, and I know all our members have uh, discussed or have, have queried um, information in relation to an application that was passed with this committee in the past that has went to DFI. Um, so I just want, if, if we can just touch on both of those. Thanks. Yes, yes no problem, Chair. So firstly, Chair, in terms of the calls for evidence are out in regard to the view or review of the legislation in terms of the Planning Act. Um, members, I've circulated that, the, the deadline for that um, and when we received it um, meant that we couldn't get a paper, a comprehensive paper to yourselves for this meeting. We will um, draft um, a response in regard to that for our special meeting, which you will be notified about on the 24th. And um, I propose to, you know, potentially send a letter to the chief planner advising that the, there wasn't sufficient time given and um, we wouldn't be able to give a comprehensive response by the 15th. Uh, if members were content with that, that we would send um, a holding response on that because at that stage we would only have a draft report that would be going into members. So I would want members' feedback on that. Um, as it's, I just want to draw to your attention as well, it's, it's particularly important. It's our opportunity for us to consider what key issues maybe over the last five years that we have been um, affected by and, and what those potential changes could be um, that would, would assist in improving the, the processing of applications and the overall planning system. So um, really that's, I just wanted to bring to your attention as soon as I could so that you, you could have time to reflect on that and that I will obviously bring a detailed report as soon as I can um, on the 24th. Thank you, Chair. Um, oh, sorry, on the second point, apologies. On the second point, Chair, yes, we have um, members will be aware at the last meeting I did notify that we had sent the the present link application to DFI and that the deadline in regard to that members just to be aware is that um, we received the formal letter from um, the chief planner on the 10th of February um, noting that we had to hold the application under the article 17 pr provision so in terms of the deadlines are 28 days so we would require the department to come back with a response um, before the 10th of March um, because that's the, the normal deadline for that. And in, in that instance, then we will be aware whether or not the DFI have formally called the application in. So we will uh, update members as soon as we've got any feedback on that, Chair. So thank you. So, uh, um, so members, are we content in relation to um, both of those items, or does anybody want to, to, to comment? So, um, we, we, there will be a detailed report brought to um, a committee in relation to the call for evidence and the re review of legislation. And um, members note that um, the, the response in relation to the present link application it's still been on it's still under consideration um by dfa um members i know that you will have it in your diaries um that there will be another meeting of the planning committee meet on march um it's scheduled for the 24th of march i just wanted to 
um, highlight that at this stage there there, there may be um, because members you you'll note that um, the following day um, is full council so it, it won't be possible for that committee to run on the, the second day so there may need to be um, slight adjustments in terms of the timings of that meeting but we'll know more um, as we approach that date and we know how many applications are are, are on the agenda for that day. Members, in, in relation to the meeting today, um, you will note that there's two applications that have been withdrawn from the schedule. So items one and six are withdrawn. In terms of the running order, um, they accommodate those who have requested speaker rights. The running order will be as follows, um, two, five, eight, three, four, seven, and nine. I'm going to just put that running order in the chat box for members, um, and I'll bring Councillor Dobbins and Angela. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, it's just a wee question for Maura and possibly yourself. How many times, um, <laughs> there's a lot of time wasting in my eyes, right? with regard to applications going on, coming up in front of us, and then uh, at the last minute, the 11th hour, there's more information coming in, right? And therefore it has to be either withdrawn or, you know, whereas there's other applications that, that we could be doing, you know, and I do realise that there may be a backlog, but like that, that even number one to be, you know, to me, how many times, how many times, is there a, a specific um, guideline as to how many times that we're going to stall this? Because in my eyes, it's a stalling mechanism. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, uh, Councillor Dobbins, and I share your frustrations, and I'm, I'm sure those frustrations will be shared by the vast majority of the committee. Um, and I know the issue of late information has been something that um, our head of planning has discussed in the past. So I'm going to take this opportunity to bring more in and hopefully she can shed some light on it. Yes, members, um, this is something that comes up repeatedly um, over the last five years. And, you know, um, officers also are very determined to try and process application and bring them to the committee and um bring certainty i suppose in terms of the the, the, the position um, and unfortunately we don't have any mechanism in the legislation at the minute that indicates how many times somebody can revise proposals or or submit late information in general um, but as i said um one of the things we mentioned this before the previous committee that it, it was something that would we, we would raise, and I have raised numerously along with other heads of planning across Northern Ireland in regard to this. Um, uh, actually, and as part of the planning forum who are instigating the review of the legislation, I've already raised this as an important issue in terms of, um, you know, in terms of how the, the, the smooth operation of the planning system. So I, for one, will be um, suggesting members we can discuss this as part of the review and the calls for evidence. So um, it would be useful if members reflect on that as well. But um, yes, it's something that we've raised and Philip has actually given us uh, advice on on numerous occasions. But um, as I said, we, we'd already discussed item one with Philip in advance and um, officers felt there was no um, no option but to remove it from the schedule and consider the information in front of us in regard to that. Hopefully that helped clarify, Councillor Dobbins. Thank you for that, Maura, and and thanks, Chair. Like I, I am I am aware of um and I'm gonna put it under two words, environmental vandalism um occurring on that site. So um I this needs addressed, you know, as soon as possible. Okay, and that's um, in relation to my earlier remarks. Um, I've been assured by officers that um, that application will be brought back, um, and without prejudice, without prejudice to this committee at their last opportunity. Um, so, 
Are we happy to proceed, members, um, onto the applications? Or no, apologies. Um, are we happy to proceed, members? Yeah. Um, moving on to the matters arising from the open minutes of the meeting held on Wednesday, the 3rd of February. Any matters arising, members? No. Um, matters arising of the reconvened planning committee held on Thursday, the 4th of February. So, members, um, heading onto the applications and the first application that's to be dealt with today is item two. It's LA 11, 2019, and it's a reserved matters application on the H2 lands in the water side. And it's Andre that's going to take us through it. Andre, you ready? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members. Um, this is item two. It's LA 11 2019 and it's a reserve matters application for the proposed residential development of 295 dwellings comprising a mix of 110 number detached, 166 semi detached, and 19 number apartments on land situated to the southwest of the A2 Clooney Road and northwest of the Ross Downey Road to the north of numbers 106. 110, 114 and 116 Ross County Road in County Londonderry, lands forming part of the H30 housing zoning um, as identified in the Dairy Area Plan 2011 and the recommendation is to approve. So this is an aerial photo of the, the site and it shows the H30 housing zoning outlined in red. Members will be aware that outline planning approval was granted for the H30 housing zoning by planning committee in 2019 subject to conditions and the application was also accompanied by a section 76 legal agreement. This slide shows the concept master plan as approved under application LA 11 2016 0422. So Members, this reserve matters application is for approximately one half of the zoned housing land. It is bounded by Clooney Road Jail Carriageway to the southwest and Ross Downey Road to the northeast. The site is currently agricultural land and it's identified in red there on the slide and the Clooney Road is indicated in green. So this is just a view of the site from the Clooney Road when approaching the Grancher roundabout. So the application has been assessed under the following, the Regional Development Strategy, the Dairy Area Plan 2011, the SPPS and Planning Policy Statements 2, 3, 7, 8 and 15. So members, this is the proposed block plan showing the layout of housing, roads, informal and formal open space on the site. Access to the site will be from the Grancher roundabout, which will be redesigned to a signalised junction. There is a mixture of semi-detached and detached dwellings with a range of designs and an, an apartment development at the gateway entrance of the site. This slide shows a portion of the site with the layout of dwellings indicated, all of which front onto the proposed roadways. All dwellings have been assessed as having acceptable amenity space and separation distance. The layout also shows extensive landscaping scheme, which is proposed for the site also. This slide shows another portion of the site, again showing the layout of dwellings, roadways, open space and landscaping. The entrance to the site is shown from Clooney Road, with a proposed apartment building indicated fronting onto the access road. This slide member shows one of the areas of open space, which will also incorporate an equipped play park. And just there are two um, equipped play areas within this reserve matters application. Um, and this slide shows the second play area, 
Um, and this will be situated within the mature vegetation and supplemented by additional landscaping. This is in the central portion of the H30 zoning. This slide shows a further area of informal open space and pathways which will be landscaped and which will provide further connectivity through the site. This area is on the western boundary. Uh, this slide member shows just two streetscapes within the development and these were supplied by the agent for the application. So streetscape one um, on the top of the slide here is along the top portion of the site adjacent to Ross Downey Road um, and it shows a range of detached and semi-detached dwellings. Uh, the streetscape two at the bottom of the slide there shows the gateway apartment building at the entrance to the development. Uh, this slide shows an elevation of two of the proposed house types. Uh, one is a large detached dwelling and the other is an elevation of one of the semi-detached dwelling house types. Um, there are a range of house types, um, all of which have a common design theme and are considered by officers to be of a high quality design. Um, this slide shows the proposed front elevation of the gateway apartment building at the entrance to the site. Um, the design is again considered to be high quality and the materials used are the brick and render which is uh, punctuated throughout the rest of the site. Um, the site is existing as a sloping site and earthworks and reprofiling of the site um, is required to deliver this housing development. Um, care has been taken to achieve a satisfactory layout and design um, and to achieve a satisfactory well necessary contours on the site with the development of split level dwellings and landscaping. Members, this um, slide shows the detail of the proposed redevelopment of the existing grants roundabout, um, which will uh, go to a signalised junction. And this improvement to the road network will be in place prior to occupation of the 150th dwelling on the site. And during the processing of the, the consul, of the application, um, the following consultees were consulted. Uh, DFI Roads, DFI Rivers, Locks Agency, Environmental Health, Historic Environment Division, Shared Environmental Services, NI Water, NI Water, NIEA Water Management Unit, NIEA Land, Soil and Air, and NIEA Natural Environment Division and all have no objections subject to conditions and informatives. Um, at the time of writing the planning report, NIEA Natural Environment Division and DFI Roads had not returned their formal consultation response, and these responses have now been received, and members will have outside of the proposed conditions as part of their, your late item pack. So, in conclusion, this is a reserved matters application. With outline planning permission granted in 2019 under LA 11 2016 the, the proposed development is in broad conformity with the outline master plan as approved. It meets the criteria of QD1 of PPS7 and that has been demonstrated a quality residential environment can be achieved. Provision of infrastructure works in accordance with PPS3, sewage and land drainage in accordance with PPS15 provision of private and public open space in accordance with PPS 8, all of which are supported through the SPPS for Northern Ireland. All consultees have no objection to the proposed development subject to conditions and informatives, and I can advise that no representations were received during the processing of the application, and therefore the recommendation is to approve. Thank you, members. Thanks, Andre. Members, um, and it is, it is remiss of me because there was great information in relation to that application. Are members content um, that they've had time to consider it before I bring on the agent? Yeah, um, members are content. So I'd now like to invite Tom Stokes and Sean Foy to address the committee. 
Thank you, Chair. You are very welcome. Um, you have five minutes. Can I just check how you can hear us okay? We can hear yeah. fine. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Chair members, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to address the committee this afternoon. Um, as you've said, online is Sean Foy uh, from Arkins, who's our traffic and drainage engineer, and happy to answer any questions. As you've learned from the officer, this application represents phases one, two, and three of the H30 master plan, and is for 295 new family homes, comprising a small number of apartments and semi detached and detached dwellings. Without repeating some of the matters uh, which your officer has covered, I'll briefly comment on the conformity with the CMP, drainage and roads infrastructure, and the level of investment in job creation. The outline planning approval was granted on September 19, included a CMP, which set out how the H30 housing zoning would be comprehensively developed. <clears throat> this covered six phases of development, and this application covers phases one to three. Our proposal is entirely in conformity with the CMP. The proposed family homes come in a variety of sizes and types, as you've seen from some of the illustrations which Andre has shared, all based on a traditional arts and craft architectural theme, as you will have noted from the images. Careful consideration has been attributed to integrating the proposal into the landscape and retaining as many trees as possible on site. The majority of new planting is directed towards the periphery of the site within the new woodland walk area and internally to create tree lined avenues. Public open space has been proposed in conformity with the locations directed by the CMP and includes a variety of linear parks and walkways, a woodland walkway, two play areas, and a sub pond with the total open space provision being above that of the normal guidance at around 18 percent. Connectivity between the various locations of the development was a key consideration at the forefront of the detailed design of this proposal, and the application includes for a variety of distributor roads, shared services, primary bus routes, bus turning are built, and a number of pedestrian connections. These phases of development also include for the upgrading of the dresser roundabout and the necessary signalisation works, which will take place prior to the occupation of the 151st house. In regard to drainage, the applicant has developed a positive drainage solution for the development. But during the course of the application, DFI roads did raise some concerns regarding potential surface water runoff from Ross Mini Roof. Ross Mini Road to mitigate this, the runoff from the Ross Mini Road will be incorporated into the proposed drainage system to be adopted by NI Water and an associated Article 161 agreement, and this has all been agreed by DFI. The proposal brings forward an extremely high quality and sustainable residential development in accordance with the CMP. As you've heard, there have been no objections from any consultees and no third party representations. The proposal represents a significant investment of around £60 million from South Bank Square and will provide around 100 local construction jobs over a five year period. We've worked very closely with your officers and all the statutory consultees over the last year in extremely challenging circumstances. And it is great to reach this key milestone today. Subject to the outcome of the committee today, our client is extremely excited about commencing works immediately. Your officers have recommended the application for approval, and we would respectfully request the committee endorse this. Thank you, Chair, for your time, and Sean and I are happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Tom. Um, I just see Alderman McClintock has come on with a question. Hilary? Thanks for letting me in, and thanks, Tom, for that presentation. We've obviously discussed this at length at uh, outline planning stage, so I'm more than happy with it. There's just one wee item that I would like clarification on. Um, it's regarding the play parks, and I'm thrilled to see that there are two play parks within this. But can you just reassure me that what the first play park that we saw up on the screen isn't in the middle of a roundabout? Um, I know it's fenced in, but it's just I notice that the roads go all the way around it. So I just would like your comments on that, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor, uh, for the question. But through the chair, um, it's no, it's not in a roundabout. It's 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 part of the bus. Temporary bus turning circle on the site, um, and as part of the landscape strategy for the development, you'll see on some of the images which Andre shared earlier, uh, Councillor, that there's a series of pockets of small open space throughout the development, um, and this one, which is on the left hand side of the development in phases one and three, uh, has a play park within it to serve that side of the development, and then you have the second uh, play area, which is 
the Sentinel tree lane avenue, which will also serve the next application, which will come forward as reserve water number two. Thanks, Chair, for, for that. Just I was concerned in case traffic was going to be wasn't around the children's play park. Um, uh, Councillor McKinney. Thank you for letting me in, Chair Tom. Uh, I really do welcome the these these houses coming in, and I really do welcome the upgrade on the Grancha roundabout because, as you know, it's a bit of a nightmare. It's not too bad at the minute because of obviously the COVID, but as restrictions um, lift and we have people start to return back to work, I I'm just wondering where, where are you bringing the construction traffic in from to to start start the build? Could you maybe just explain that to me a bit, please? Yeah, again, um, thanks for thinking for the question and through the chair. I might bring Sean fully in here, but um, I'll uh, I'll give a go first. The so the phasing of how the I suppose the infrastructure associated with this site is that it all has to be accessed off the branch and roundabout. So the first thing that has to happen is there be a new arm uh, developed off the branch and roundabout to serve this site. Um, and then, as Andre had mentioned, that I had mentioned in my presentation, the roundabout itself, that full junction with Francia, is upgraded and signalised uh, at the hundred and fifty birth point. Uh, but construct there's a there's a requirement under the outline pension of the construction traffic uh, uses the Francia roundabout for access. Shall I go through you anything? I know you're online. If you've anything to add. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Um... Councillor, I would just confirm that that's the case. The initial construction traffic at the at the request and through detailed consultations with uh, the FI road um, will be coming through Grantshire uh, roundabout. The, we'll put the initial section of link road in. The intention is that we effectively want to build up a little bit of traffic uh, generated by the network before installing the traffic signals. That generally makes it a sort of safer arrangement. We don't want to be putting the traffic signals in too early when there's very little traffic um, coming off the site. That can add the driver frustration of people. If you can imagine people on the on the main Clooney Road are are you know brought to a standstill waiting at a stop line, uh, you know, when there, there's limited or, or or no traffic coming out. So the analysis indicated that the by putting in an additional arm off the roundabout using the, the facility, um, it'll work satisfactorily initially, but as, as as the traffic builds up within the site, uh, we've detailed proposals approved, approved by DFI roads to convert that to a substantial um, signalised uh, intersection. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you, Sean. I thank you, Tom, just for confirming all that for me. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, Sean, Councillor Money. Thank you, Chair. Uh, how you doing, Tom and Sean? Thanks for that uh, presentation and for welcome development. I noticed from the pack that you had, you, you did, um, you've done work with Translink about bringing in a bus service into the, the site as well. And I noticed that you've had a travel charge scheme to incentivize or maybe possibly minimize um, private car use. But I was wondering, would you have any more information as to maybe what type of service Translink would provide, or is that just at a sort of um, early discussion phase at the moment, just obviously that we can maybe try and minimise private car use. Again, Chair, maybe Sean Foy here, if I can just uh, respond to that. Um, uh, Councillor, you're absolutely right, there's been a lot of discussion with TransLink um, on this uh, subject, so there's been a, the, 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 the site itself has been carefully designed uh, in a phased manner as the site develops to integrate um, bus access um, with um, uh, the, the, the design and layout of the site. So um, they're, they're uh, satisfied that the, the adequate access is provided. Um, the initial plans are that um, TransLink will be inter uh, integrating existing services within the site that are passing by. They're satisfied that there's a high frequency of services there um, that are currently available. Um, and clearly, um, there's a balance here between sort of delaying um, existing services and service in this site. But again, a, a lot of detailed discussion has taken place. Clearly, um, the expectation is by providing these services and, uh, and a high level of design within the site that we provide the facility from day one, you know, once we get sort of reasonable uh, construction within the site and get, get the access roads and the, and the services um, uh, uh, into the site, that that they will start um, over over time, clearly, as we get to the full um, 
development of the site. Um, Translink are sort of ha will keep a watch and brief, and that clearly at that point, if we're ge generating um, significant demand uh, for public transport services from the site into the, in the city centre and so on, then that's a sort of a good place for Translink to be. So, um, you know, services would be reviewed accordingly. But um, at the minute, the intention is to really just build up using uh, existing services. But uh, their priority was just to make sure that uh, we, we put the services as close as we could to the residents to make it within a sort of reasonable uh, walking distances, particularly given the nature and layout of the site. So we're, we're really satisfied that uh, that, that uh, consultation and discussion with them um, will prove fruitful as the site develops. Thanks, Senator. If I maybe just add to that, because I have the benefit of the Section 76 agreement, which was agreed to the events at Miss Amy, uh, in terms of travel cards, um, they be offered to individual dwellings, and um, so there's no, there's no allowance in there for about the hundred and thirty three thousand pounds, and um, to offer travel cards to new residents, and then there's a series of trigger points agreed in the section seventy six, just as Sean has sort of to build on what Sean said there as the site develops, and um, the bus route also develops with the site, and there's a series of trigger points, uh, and not section seventy six to govern that as well. Thank you. Um, Councillor Money, does that answer your question? That's great, Chair. Thank you. It's just really, um, really sort of, that's really sort of a novel idea about the travel cards to try and incentivize the, or actually try to minimize private carriers. And I'm happy to hear what Sean said about the, the plans for Translink as well. So thank you to both and thank you, Chair. Is there any further questions for Sean or Tom? No. Councillor Boy, come ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure whether it's Tom or, or, or Sean that can answer this, but I, I think it's more more of interest than 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 anything. Um, have you any kind of timelines or time frames in, uh, in mind in terms of moving it forward and when we might expect to see completion or relative completion, Tom? Thanks uh, again, Councillor, through the chair. Yeah, so hopefully, um, subject to obviously the outcome of committee today, uh, there's a couple of pre commencement conditions which we need to deal with in relation to archaeology and forming the access of the branch around the which I talked about um, earlier. But hopefully, Councillor, uh, said subject to the outcome of today, we'd like to be on site immediately. And you would like to think we would see the first house there within sort of nine to twelve months. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, look, thanks, thanks for the reply. And obviously, you know, within the content of the report, uh, it's evident that you're that you know that you're wanting to uh, proceed uh, as quickly and as you say, obviously, subject to your decision today. Um, but again, just to thank you all for coming along here this afternoon and, and presenting to us. Uh, it's important that you do do that, um, uh, and I'm sure uh, in, in association in conjunction with council officers, um, again, obviously subject to decision, um, we can get it there. If indeed, we're all minded to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, members are going to move on. Um, if there's no further questions for Sean or Tom, again, like Councillor Boyle, I just want to thank you for your attendance today and and I suppose your work with council officers to get us to this point. Um, and speaking on that, is there any questions to officer? Any questions for Andre? No. Alderman McClintock? Question, Chair, but if nobody has any questions, uh, can I move to a proposal? Go ahead. Um, I would be happy to propose that we accept the officer's recommendation. I think this is a, a great moment for the water side. We're so in need of houses here, and it's great to see a development of this size. Um, and I look forward to seeing uh, not only the houses, but the whole re uh, reconfiguration, shall we say, of the roundabout at Caw. It was a very welcome uh, development and I look forward to seeing it come into fruition. Thank you. 
note in the chat box that that's been seconded by Councilman Money. For members, if there's no further comments, I'm going to take that to a vote. No, so members, there's a there's a recommendation they approve um, by Alderman McClintock, seconded by Councillor Money. Is there anybody wishing? I haven't heard anybody speak against that, so can I take that as unanimous? Yeah. Okay, members, I'm going to take that as unanimous. Um, so that application has been approved. And members, I know um, I know we've had a few of the Waterside councillors um, speaking in, in relation to this application as a fellow Waterside councillor. I can say that there's been a lot of excitement about this application following the outline permission that was passed. And I'm I'm absolutely delighted that we were able to proceed with a reserve matters application in such a very fast time frame. So um and and as Alderman McClantic alluded to, um the particularly welcome the, the play facilities, the um, the the upgrade of the road network and the much needed realignment of the call roundabout. So this is a fantastic application. That's I'm delighted that that it's it's we've been able to get to this stage so soon, and I'm delighted that the committee has endorsed the application. So um, I just wanted to add my voice to my other watershed colleagues. Um, before we move on now to um, item number five in our packs, next on our list is um, LA 11 2020. 0378 and it's an outline application for a, a house and a garage um, at south of 72 Dumley Church Road um, and it's Laura that's going to take us through this. Laura there? Yeah. Okay, Laura, can you share your presentation or somebody else sharing it? Yeah. All right. Is that okay now? Yeah, go on ahead. Thank you. Okay, so um, item five on the agenda um, is an application, an outline application for a dwelling and a garage, um, LA 11 2020 Um It's located approximately 50 metres south of number 72, um, Drumlega Church Road in Drumlega. Um, the recommendation is to refuse. Um, so as you can see on the slide here, um, the site location plan on the aerial photo, um, the site is defined by the red line as a section of a larger agricultural field and it's located east of Drumlega Church Road. Um, there is no defined boundary um, along the east of the red line. A mature hedge forms part of the roadside boundary and the southern side boundary and the northern boundary is defined by a wooden fence. Um, the site sits slightly below the road level and the field gradually rises to the rear. Um, uh, the application site is located at the end of a row of buildings, um, including a domestic dwelling. Um, so this slide just outlines the relevant policy context under which this application was assessed, um, including Strand Area Plan, Strategic Plan Policy Statement, um, PPS 21 and PPS 3. Um, this is just a few images um, uh, of, of the application site um, at the entrance to it um, along Drumlega Church Road. Um, so in the first instance, the proposal um, is assessed in terms of the principle of development um, under PPS 21 and policy CTY8. Um, so policy CTY8 allows for the development of a small gap site um, sufficient to accommodate um, up to a maximum of two houses within an otherwise substantial and continuously built up frontage. Um, it's policy CTY8 states that plan and permission will be refused for a building which creates or adds to a ribbon of development. Um, so it is considered um, that a result of the separation distance between 
um, the application site and number 76 um, there, and the topography of, of the land in that area. Um, it doesn't have a common frontage onto the road um, and it's not visually linked with the application site or the any of the other buildings at this location. Um, Therefore, it's considered that this application site is not a small gap site located within a substantial and continuously built up frontage. Um, it's also considered that a permitting a dwelling at this location, um, we would be adding to an existing ribbon of development. Um, and as such, the proposal is contrary to policy CTY 8 and CTY 14 of PPS 21, and that it would result in a suburban style build up of development, um, which is detrimental to the character of the area. Um, though the proposal is not considered acceptable in principle, it's also considered under policy CTY 13. Um, this is an outline application, so no specific details have been provided. Um, but in terms of the site boundaries and the topography, um, the site has the potential um, to integrate um, a dwelling on this site. Um, in terms of CTY 16, um, the P1 form states that um, sewage will, will be disposed of by a septic tank and environmental health don't have any objections. Um, and in terms of PPS3, um, DFI roads have no concerns in relation to the proposal subject to submission of scale plans and accurate surveys um, as part of any reserve matters application. Therefore, the proposal complies with PPS3. Um, just in terms, um, we had three representations received um, in respect of this proposal. Um, uh, from the one, um, the one property owner, um, they were concerned that the proposal didn't um, comply with planning policy. Um, there was queries regarding land ownership and visibility displays, and um, in terms of the validity of the application. Um, so, in terms of the the policy consideration, um, we consider that the proposal um, is contrary to policy CTY 8 and 14, um, as detailed in the presentation and the report. Um, in terms of the land ownership visibility displays, um, the applicants provided information which states that they have easement for the site lines. Um, so this is a legal matter which is um, outside of um, plan and remit. Um, the objector has also been um, advised and notice has been served upon them. Um, um, and in terms of the validity of the proposal, we are content that the application which was received is valid. Um, so overall, um, we consider that the proposal is contrary to plan and policy, and therefore refusal is recommended for the reasons set out in the report. Thanks, Laura. Um, I invite Haley Dallas to address the committee. You're very welcome, Haley. Um, you have five minutes to make your comments. Thank you, Chair and members. I'm representing neighbours who object to the proposal for two reasons. Firstly, because the site for the new dwelling is very close to their property and has the potential to impact their residential amenity. And secondly, because the proposal does not meet any of the criteria stipulated within PPS 21 that warrant it as an exceptional development in the countryside. A full list of my clients' concerns have been set out in three letters of objection to the proposal. We therefore support the decision to refuse this application. Our first reason for refusal relates to the potential impact of the dwelling on the residential amenity of number 72 Drumlager Road, the objector's home. From an amenity aspect, my clients do not want a dwelling permitted directly above their own private amenity space and directly visible from the front of their property. My client's property is positioned perpendicular to the road and fronting onto the proposed site. It would be impossible for them to not be detrimentally impacted by the proposal in terms of their loss of privacy and private amenity, and it would be unfair for such a proposal to be permitted when it is evident that it will have a negative impact on the residents' enjoyment of their home. Whilst there is no indicated position of the proposed dwelling, it is not unreasonable to assume that it could be positioned like number 72 and 76 cable facing the road. If it was, our clients would look straight directly into the property from the front of their house and vice versa. In these terms, the proposal would harm the private amenity enjoyed at our client's dwelling. As the proposed site is topographically higher than the objector's property, the proposed scheme would result in an overbearing form of development that would cause overlooking and would harm the existing amenity of those that live at number 72 
and it would be contrary to the SPPS, which states that private immunity ought to be protected in the public interest. Our second reason for objection relates to the principle of development. The applicant is trying to secure planning permission under CTY 8 of PPS 21, but the site does not meet the exception to criteria as stipulated by the policy. The exception is that planning permission may be granted when there is a small gap within a built up frontage comprising of three or more buildings and a line along a road without accompanying development to the rear. Figure number two in the case officer's report, um, it's evident that there are three buildings along the road frontage of this part of the Drumlega Road. However, the important thing is that the site does not present as a gap between these buildings, which is the crux of the exception to the policy. The applicant is relying on number 76 from Lager Road being considered as having a road frontage. However, number 76 is set back some 115 metres from the road's edge, whilst, number, or whilst in comparison, number 72 is 2.8 metres from the road's edge. Whilst policy is open to interpretation, it is clear that a dwelling does not have a road frontage if it is set back such a distance. A recent appeal decision by Commissioner McGlinchey in 2020 regarding a CTY8 application clearly states that if only an access connects with the road, as it does in this application, it is not considered as a road frontage dwelling. The Council's planning officer has rightly assessed that number 76 does not have a common frontage onto the road and it is not visually linked with the application site or the other buildings at this location. The application therefore fails to meet the exception to criteria of CTY8 as it is not as a gap within a continuously built up frontage. A dwelling on the site would be considered as contributing to ribbon development, which is detrimental to the character, appearance and amenity of the countryside and has consistently been opposed by this council. We therefore respectively request that this committee uphold the recommendation to refuse permission. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members, is there any questions for Hayley? No. Okay, thank you, Hilly. Um, now, can I invite Brent Jones from the Presidency Committee on behalf of the Wigan? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, members. Um, this proposal for a dwelling in the countryside was considered under PPS 21 uh, and the SPPS, as stated by Council in the refusal reasons. Uh, Council cited three reasons for refusal based on those policies uh, under CTY1 and also the SPPS. Policy CTY8, Ribbon Development, and CTY14, Rural Character. Uh, PPS21 at Policy CTY8 considers the proposal against Ribbon Development, and Council does not consider the proposal as an exception um, to the criteria set out, this being the main reason for refusal. But councillors should note that the application was not made as an infill dwelling, but as set out on the planning P1 form simply as a dwelling and garage. Yet the proposal was only assessed under CTY 8, uh, despite PPS 21 telling us at section 5 that the council and its duty for development management should assess development proposals against all planning policies and importantly other material considerations that are relevant to it. It goes on to state that the provisions of these policies will prevail unless there are other material considerations that outweigh them and justify a contrary decision. So it is open to councillors to determine if other material considerations can outweigh the single planning policy used by the planners to determine this application. Uh, it is important to remind the council that the PPS 21 was introduced in June 2010. However, the SPPS, which is selectively used in Refusal Reason 1, was introduced in September 2015 as a tool for the, councillors, or sorry, the Council's future strategy for sustainable development of the countryside through its local development plans. And as you'll be aware, the new Derry and Straban LDP is currently under preparation and therefore the provisions contained within the PPS will reflect the aims, objectives and policy approach for years to come. So some of these policies contained within the SPPS are already been implemented. The regional development strategy wasn't mentioned in the consideration of the application, but as highlighted in the SPPS, it states that the policy approach must be to cluster, consolidate and group new development with existing established buildings. This would mitigate 
the potential adverse impact on rural amenity and rural landscapes from the cumulative uh, effect of one-off sporadic development. Uh, the Regional Development st uh, Strategic Policy also states that all development in the countryside must integrate into its setting and must not result in urban sprawl. Uh, planners have used neither of these in their reasons for refusal. Uh, the policy provisions and tests of the SPPS are less onerous, we know, than PPS 21, but nevertheless, they are material consideration uh, relevant to the proposal. Considering that the provisions of the SPPS are being presently been incorporated within the new local development plan, then significant weight must be attached to them, which we would suggest would outweigh the outdated PPS 21 and justify a contrary decision. Um, as noted in the case officer's report, uh, while the area is rural in context, there is a dwelling and numerous outbuildings immediately to the north. Uh, that's at number 72. Dwelling to the north on the opposite side of the road at number 61, and another dwelling with a tree laneway immediately adjoining to the southeast at number 76. Immediately adjoining this laneway is a large open agricultural field measuring some five hectares, which clearly redefines the open countryside. When viewed from the southern approach, there would be filtered views of a dwelling clustered with and red with number 72 and existing outbuildings as a backdrop. And when viewed from the northern approach, number six, or sorry, number 76 with its tree laneway provides a natural visual stop line to any development. Photographs and aerial photographs were submitted by the agent to demonstrate the high degree of intervisibility between the proposed site and the existing buildings. While we recognise that no two applications are the same, the proposed form and pattern of development has been accepted within other council areas, and a similar application was approved in the Fermanagh council area uh, with details that were supplied uh, to the planners. So clearly, a dwelling on the proposed site meets the policy approach advocated by the regional development strategy in that the proposed development clusters, consolidates and groups with existing established buildings. And to conclude, we would argue that the Council have not assessed this case against all planning policies and material considerations as required by PPS 21, and that the provisions of the RDS are a strong material consideration which in this case should be given determining wit to overturn the planner's recommendations and justify an approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, members, is there, I know we've got a, a few indicated questions for the officer, but is there any questions for the agent? Mr. Jones? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, Alderman Kerrigan. Sorry, hi, I couldn't get it typed in quick enough there, Chair. Um, just, <laughs> just seeking clarif clarification, if that's all right there, in relation to um, the, the policy there, um, because it just uh, my connection just cut out a little bit there. I'm just asking there in regards to the policy which the, the agent says that the application was submitted under, that it was not submitted under PPS 21. So just, just if you could clarify that point there, that he is, uh, he he's he's basing his um, application under SPPS rather than under PPS twenty one. Is that correct? If you could just clarify that for me, please, Chair. John and Brendan, can you clarify that? Okay, we might have seem to have lost them. Mr. Jones. Hello, Chair. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um if I could just um address that last issue that um it's I, I was we weren't um submitting the application totally under the SPPS. Um I was referring to the planning policy statement 21, which has been in, out since 2010. Uh, it, it comments, and I, I read out what it actually comments, that, uh, that all development proposals should be considered against all planning policies and uh, planning guidance. 
and the SPPS is a material consideration in that because it has now been used partially uh, for uh, existing planning applications where it is where it is relevant. But what I'm saying is that the councillors need need to um, address the weight given to what's in the SPPS and in the and in the planning policy statement 21 uh, in terms of um, whether or not CTY 8 applies to this. We simply applied for a dwelling and a garage and to be considered under all planning policy and not just CTY 8. Thank you. That, that's grand, Chair. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Is there any further questions, members? Um, again, I'm going to thank Mr. Jones um, and move on to questions to the officer. And the first indicated was Councillor McKinney. Your question you, for Laura? Yes, the question for Laura. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Laura, on your presentation, did I see something about land ownership? There's a problem with it. Um, through the Chair, um, yes, well, Councillor McKinney, the Objector to the application um, had raised concerns in terms of um, land ownership for the, the visibility space. Um, so uh, the, the applicant um, has advised that they have easements um, for this place. Um, a notice was then served upon um, the objector, um, advising them, you know, in terms of land ownership. Um, Technically, this type of thing is outside of the, the planning remit, um, and that's between the, the objector and the applicant, really. Um, and do you know, do they sort it outside of the planning application process? I yeah. just say, speak there, Chair. So, yeah, go ahead, Paul. E e even if, sir, even if we were to turn this around and say approve, basically, until the, uh, the legal thing has been sorted out. It, uh, it, it can't go any further. So my question would be is why uh, being brought to us without all the legal implications being sorted out first? Um, Laura, do you want to ask, answer that? Or... Sure, I could come in there maybe, Suzanne. Oh, so I was, I was about to suggest yourself, Suzanne. Um, Councillor McCarthy, just the the certificate of ownership details on an application interest of parties so you don't have a donor to an application um and this is what's happened in this case um so in terms of decision making in terms of the legal status of things we're content that that the everybody who's an interest in the land is aware of it and we can proceed uh whether or not there's an agreement or whatever happens is, is, is outside the planning process but clearly um we would I mean this would happen in, in lots of applications so we will we'd have no reason not to bring it forward if we're content that the notices have been served appropriately on all the interested parties thank you very much for Suzanne thank you okay thanks um next on the speaker is Councillor McGuire Kieran thank you chair uh, first of all could I ask Laura is there is there accompanied buildings to the rear of uh, the north of the red line of the, the, the site in red? Is there uh, just buildings to the rear of that? Um, so, Chair, um, Councillor, um, we would consider those buildings to the north um, of the Sorry. site. To Oh, sorry. sorry, apologies. Um, it might help if we can have. Uh, can we get an overhead on the screen? Um, yeah, I'll share this again. That slide there shows the site location plan. Is, is that okay? Grant, thanks. Um. So yeah. Um. You were speaking about the, the dwellings there, the property number 72 and the, the buildings beyond that. Um, so they would be considered to be road frontage um, buildings. Um, the rear of the site um, will be considered to be 
um, the eastern site boundary and beyond um, where the, the agricultural field is. Here, here, there, there is buildings at the rear. Um, so no, we wouldn't consider the the those buildings number seventy two, um, and and that row of buildings to be to the rear of the site. We consider the rear of the site to be the eastern boundary of the site, where the field where the site goes under the under the under the adjoining field. That would be the rear of the site. Yeah, but really that house is facing, you know, the field. It's not facing the road, so what's at the rear? Is that so? We're going to kind of interpretations here, Laura, would we? Um. Well, we haven't said, um, and you know, in our assessment of the application, that there's any, you know, development to the rear. Um, we've assessed it. Um, you know, that it doesn't. Um, comply with the exception and that it's not a gap site um, sufficient to accommodate only one dwell. Um, and you know we have said that it's actually extending that row of buildings and that ribbon of development that's already there, which includes number 72 um, and the, the buildings beyond that along the road. That's where I'm a bit confused because reading CTY8, um, the exception be permitted for a small gap site, maximum two, uh, within an otherwise substantially continuously built up frontage, uh, and go on. For the purpose of this policy, the definition of a substantial and built up frontage includes a line of three or more buildings along a road frontage, which we have, without accompanying development to the rear. So there is accompanying development to the rear of this one. And then when you read on into uh, the justification, uh, a road frontage includes a footpath or private lane. And then like there's a private lane at the southern boundary of the site. So that would make me think that this is not actually ribbon development. This is actually an infill. Um, so that kind of stifles the argument for, C for ribbon development and indeed uh, the CTY14 argument, Chair. So, um, I'm sure there's other speakers, but I, I would like to make a proposal, but I, I would like to maybe other speakers, if you want to take them first, or do you want me to take the proposal first, or do you want to hear the debate? Well, we didn't see it. Um, there's, there's another indicated speaker. Um, there's a few there's, there's other indicated speakers, so um, okay. I'll come back to you before anybody makes a proposal. Okay. Thanks. Um, Councillor Dobbins. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, it's, uh, it's sort of on the back of what uh, Councillor Philip McKinley had said there. And can I ask Suzanne, maybe for a wee bit of clarity around this, why and how or how can, can we give consideration to a plan and application um, when the actual plans may or may not be right or wrong? I, I'm a wee bit confused. You're saying that the the displays there could be a, a dispute about the ownership of land regarding displays, which knocks off the the actual plan and application as a whole being uh, up in the air. Then, so why are we getting asked to give um, any consideration to this plan and application to refuse or to approve whenever uh, it's not the application that that may be the end result? Depending on on what comes out of the civil action between owner uh, uh, regarding own ownership, uh, I hope you I hope I made myself sort of clear there, Suzanne. But I would like an answer there. Okay, through yeah. the chair. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks. Can I just ask the city solicitor to come on? Um, okay, yeah. And provide a bit of clarity in that respect, Philip. Yeah, uh, chair. It's just to say that it's perfectly possible for a planning application to be submitted in respect of land. Over which one doesn't have ownership, that planning permission can then be granted. Uh, but uh, the difficulties can arise with implementation um, of the planning permission at a later stage. Um, so it's perfectly perfectly possible uh, that the committee can uh, could grant planning permission for a, a development in respect of land which the applicant doesn't have ownership of, 
the applicant would then have to acquire ownership of the land in order to be able to uh, complete the development or gain easements or something of that nature in respect of it. Yeah. So just the, the, that, that, that's the ownership point. Um, and Chair, just in relation to um, Councillor McGuire's uh, point uh, in relation to the, the road frontage, um, the position is, I think, that, that was actually outlined by the objector as well, is that um, the um, uh, the PAC has held in the past um, that simply a driveway or a gateway entrance onto the road doesn't count as a road frontage. So just wanted to clear up those two points. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. Uh, Suzanne, do you want to come in? Have you anything further to add? Anzo, no, Philip's any... covered that. Thanks, Chair. Anzo, does it um, shed any light on it? Does that answer your query? Uh, well, do you know what? I'm going to answer it with yes and no. We are at, we're being asked here to um, consider a planned application for a, a dwelling, a garage, and, um, you know, the, the Splays, you know, entrances and exits. Whenever we're not fully uh, full power with all all the relevant information, you know, it may be, it may not be. Um, and why should you take it on board, Philip? What you're saying? Um, I just I'm wondering, you know, to me, this is a waste of time. Okay, um, Alderman Kerrigan. Thank you, Chair. Um... Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm only confusing the situation, but uh, Chair, I, I was under the impression in my reading of the notes there and knowing that area and the lie of the land there, that that, that uh, the applicant uh, who's seeking the outline plan and permission had uh, had, a, had a claim or had a right away, even though he may not own this, that they were on, the, the sight lines were on his uh, remit, that he had the legal obligation to take them or, or you, you know, that they were included and has whenever that site at 72 was sold, but uh, maybe I'm wrong on that, but uh, Chair, and again, I would be more minded here, to be fair, knowing that area, and I was on that road today in relation to another issue, um, I was past that site because I was I was out, there's a, there's a, a legal dumping taking place below that site actually, uh, Chair, as well, so I was out there getting a note of that and I'll report that to, to the relevant council department, but um, I know the area well. I know the the type of the land, and I would have, I would be, of a, of a, uh, I would be of a different opinion from council in relation to CTY eight and CTY fourteen, and relation to the suburb, suburban style build up when viewed with existing buildings. I would be minded that a dwelling house in there would suit the the line of buildings and the, on that from like a church road in relation to you know, filling in the gap there in relation to further on up there. There's a cluster of houses. There's farm buildings the opposite side of the road. On the lower side of it there, there's number 73 and the dwelling house built below it. There's another two sites on down. So it, I don't see that it would cause any more of a suburban style build up. It would be very similar to the existing line on that from like the church road. And as well as that, in relation to, uh, you, you know, uh, no overriding reason there, the first refusal of reason, uh, CTY1, PPS21, I would have been minded again, you, you know, in my opinion, but maybe I'm wrong, it falls back to the ban area plan, the 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 123.2.1, the rural remainder policy. So I would be minded the case could be argued. Again, in relation to, I take fully on board, sorry, Mayor, I take fully on board the, the uh, in, re, in relation to the, uh, the objectors here, uh, and in relation to their own amenity here. But I think there's potential there of putting on conditions uh, in relation to any dwelling house that restrict the size and and location and try to put it onto maybe facing the road rather than as they have said that their gables facing the road. But uh, I'll be interested to hear what what Councillor uh, McGuire's proposal is if he's if he's coming forward or not. Thank you, Chair. So, Alderman Kagan, and I don't believe there was a question within that. Um... Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Chair, for letting us in. Uh, Chair, and just on the point of legalities and all the rest, of it, I think that for other councillors, like we, this is a valid application, and that's why we're talking about it. Therefore, you know, the decision lies with with councillors, and any legal matters I, uh, is not for us to determine. So, I, I think that we're well within our 
guidelines to proceed as, as a plan and application and as a plan and application only. So I, I and listen to all the speakers and the rest, I would tend to uh, agree with Councillor McGuire and Councillor Carrigan around uh, looking at the map and looking at the uh, um, previous projects that we have looked at that are very similar to this and we have approved in the past. So I I would be content to of Councillor and I'm guessing that Councillor McGuire is making a proposal to overturn this decision. I'd be happy to second it. Okay. Uh, members, if there's no further questions, then we'll bring Councillor McGuire on. Yeah, Chair, thank you. Um, I listened to the debate and I, I listened to Philip's advice as well, but uh, I do want to maybe state that the Stavon area plan does have the 123.2.1 in the rural remainder policy, uh, which I think is very relevant to this today. Uh, also, as I said earlier, the urban development, um, to me, the house, the, the, the company in development to, I think it's house number 72 is to the rear. So therefore, uh, to me, that is one of the exceptions in the urban development policy. Uh, also, the private laneway is also an exception and there's grounds for uh, uh, an infill. So that, to me, does away with uh, CTY 14 as well. So on them grounds, Chair, I'd like to propose that we do not accept the officer's uh, recommendation to refuse and, and approve. Um, and Councillor Gallagher indicated that he was happy to second that proposal. Members, is there any further comments before I take that vote? And I note that the, it, it won't be unanimous. There is a difference of opinion, so we will require a recorded vote on this. Any further questions, members? No. Just. Uh, I forget. Yeah, just, Chair, there just seems to be, you know, a bit of ambiguity around whether we should be assessing this or not. And I think, and I know Philip came in, but there's there, there's a sense, or I'm getting the sense that people are taking some legal matters further down the road and bringing that into the present. And I don't think that they should be considering legal matters here in the present. Uh, as 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 a uh, I mean now, if people want to consider around putting conditions, that's a, probably a separate matter. But as as on purely on the legal, I don't think that that should be allowed into our judgments. Just as as a point of clarity. A hundred percent, Councillor Gallagher, the land ownership is is not something for this committee to determine. So. Um, uh, members should bear that in mind in, in relation to um, casting a vote in relation to this. Um, Councillor Boyle, is it in, I, I don't want to dwell on, on the land ownership issue, um, but... Chair, Chair uh, and I wasn't going to dwell on it either, in fairness. Um, uh, it's been very well explained by officers. Uh, and I don't know why we're getting hung up on it, um, because the city solicitor has already uh, pointed out, uh, to, for the benefit of all of uh, us on this committee, where that stands in relation to uh, this particular application. So, you know, really, I th we're all looking at this, or we should be looking at this from the perspective of the report that's been presented to us and the planning policies that we have to apply to it. Um, whatever other legal issues are out there, they, they, you know, um, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to suggest that they're not important, but that, but but they're not something. That, yes, correct. Others have said it. They're not something that we have any particular control over. So we have to apply our thoughts uh, uh, in relation to this application, and we have to think about what planning policies we feel are relevant to it. The legal, the legal stuff. That's that's for another day, and that's for somebody else. Um, so, members, there's a proposal um, from Councillor McGuire not to accept the officer's recommendation to refuse, but to 
to approve the application, um, which has been seconded by Councillor Gallagher. I'm assuming subject to standard conditions. Members, um, I ask more to take us to a vote. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, recorded vote for item five members. Um, Councillor Jason Barr. Barr. Thank you, Councillor John Boyd. Sorry, can I just for clarity, can I ask what it is that I'm actually being asked to vote upon? Sorry, I'll come in there, Chair. Is that okay? Or do you want to cover it? Yeah, go on ahead. I, I yeah. thought I thought it did provide that. I thought, thought provided that clarity. Before. Sorry, I thought too. Apologies, um, Councillor Boyle. I thought that the chair had indicated that this uh, vote was uh, as a result of the proposal made by Councillor Maguire, um, which was to overturn the recommendation of officers. Um, so that's, not, that's okay, Maura. Right, just yeah. to be clear. Uh, no, I'm Thank against you. that. No problem. I just thought that was already covered. Apologies. No, no, sorry. Just to, just to be clear. Uh, no, I'm against that. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Thank you, Alderman Alan Breslin. Board. Thank you, Councillor Angela Dobbins. I fully accept um, Philip Kingston's uh, advice. But I am against overturning the officer's decision. Thank you, Councillor Dobbins. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Councillor Gallagher. Four. Thank you. Councillor Sean Harkin. Councillor Harkin. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Sorry, Councillor Jackson didn't get. Four. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly. Four, Maura. Thank you. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Four, Maura. Alderman Holly McClintock. Four, Maura. Councillor Kim McGuire. Four, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Philip McKinney. Abstain, Maura. Thank you. Councillor Aileen Mellon. Four, Maura. Sorry, I just didn't get that, Aileen. Four. Thank you. And Councillor Sean Minnie. Uh, against. Thank you, Maura. Thank you. So that's three against. Two abstentions and nine four on that vote, Chair. So that uh, vote passes. Thank you. Thanks, Maura. Um, so, as Maura has outlined, that, that application has been approved. Um, members, our next application is LA11. 2020-0650 and it's it, it's an outline application for a conversion of a building and this single story dwelling um and it's maliki that's going to take us through this on ahead maliki um, thank you chair good afternoon members um item eight is la 11 2020-0650 um it's an outline application for a proposed conversion of a building into a single story dwelling at outbuilding immediately west of 203 Kildog Road, and the recommendation is to refuse. Um, on the left hand side here on the screen, you will see the site location. The site is outlined in red. It's uh, accessed via an existing uh, private laneway. Uh, it's on a higher level than the Kildog Road. Um, it's in a highly vegetated area. Um, there's an existing uh, abandoned house. Um, just to the, the, the north east of the site uh, and the, the outbuildings are located here. Um, and on the, the right hand side is a, a proposed block plan. On the left of that, of that image, you will see an existing ground floor plan of the outbuildings. 
Uh, and on the right hand side, um, you'll see a proposed um, floor plan in terms of alterations uh, to provide a, a, a dwelling. Um, as I said, the site is located on a higher level, the Kildog Road. Um, it's not visible from the, the Kildog Road. Um, this first image here, um, there's a large well to the northeast of the site, which has an existing laneway, which is not associated with the proposal. Uh, on the second image is the, the, the existing laneway, um, which is the proposed access um, to the, the outbuildings uh, that are part of this application site. Uh, the policy context in relation to this application um, is principally SPPS and PPS 21 in terms of uh, the principle of acceptability of a residential property in the countryside. Um, as you're aware, CTY1 sets out a list of range of types of development which in principle acceptable in the countryside. Um, one of those is a conversion of an on residential building, um, provided as uh, accords with the, the policy CTY4. Um, in addition to that, paragraph 6.73 of the SPPS provides further policy um, in, in relation to conversion and reuse of existing buildings for residential use. Uh, CTY4, um, the main policy considerations this is the, the merits of the building to, con to be converted. So the policy test within CTY4, it has to be suitable. Um, where the SPPS specifies a conversion has to be of locally, a locally important building. Um, the SPPS states uh, in the preamble that where there's a conflict between the SPPS and the, the retained policy, which is PPS 21 in this case, um, any policy clarification provided the SPPS should um, be accorded greater weight in the assessment of the individual plan application. Therefore, in this case, the, the officers have uh, afforded greater weight to the, the, the policy test within the SPPTS, SPPS. And therefore, um, we were, in terms of the suitability of the Baldwin, um, we assess it of whether it was not, it was a locally important Baldwin. SPPS provides examples of the type of locally important Baldwins which merit a sympathetic conversion. Uh, these include schoolhouses, churches, and older traditional barns and outbuildings. Um, and further to the, the type of buildings, it also specifies that the conversion to single house would be acceptable for proposal with secure the buildings, upkeep, and retention. Um, you'll see the, the attached images of the, the outbuilding to be converted. Um, as stated earlier, the, the building is invisible in the, the local context. It, um, can't be seen from any public views. You must go up the, the laneway to actually be aware of the Baldens. It's located in a fairly heavily vegetated area. Um, so the, the Baldens at present you know, appear to be used for storage. Um, as you say, they have a mixture of old stonework and block work, no recent block work. Um, they have openings, but there's no doorways, etc. And they have a corrugated iron, um, sorry, corrugated tin roof finishes. Uh, so it's just there's two. That's the front of the buildings. That's the rear of the buildings. Um, just a note to for the members that the site is uh, located with would have been uh, a curtilage of a a previous uh, dwelling house, like no, which has been abandoned. Um, which number two, two hundred and three Keldo Road. There's a two story dwelling um, with no roof on it adjacent and. Um, it appears from the site visit that the outbuildings under consideration would have been ancillary storage buildings associated with this uh, uh, abandoned building. Um, and just to note as well that we have approved um, a development opportunity um, for the applicant under LA 11 19 for a replacement uh, of the, the dwelling, as you see before you here. So that's just located again just to the northeast of the, the outbuildings. So in terms of CTY4 and our and the SPPS is our consideration that the building is not a locally important or suitable building worthy of conversion. Um, we believe it's an abandoned building that poor state of repair. Um, still it was used as installery installery storage. Um, it exhibits no special architectural features, um, which would be enhanced or maintained by proposal conversion. Um, 
it's reused for residential purposes and not necessary for its upkeep or um or preservation. It's it's retention preservation as a shed would actually require much less uh intervention than converting it to a dwelling. Um it's our belief that based on the proposals and the outline proposals, the conversion would require a significant degree of intervention. Um approval of this proposal would create an undesirable uh, precedent in the countryside given the the prevalence of um similar buildings in the countryside and a development opportunity doesn't does exist on the holding and officers contend that the applicant should avail of that opportunity. In addition to PPS 21, we've also considered PPS 3 in terms of access, movement, and parking. Um, at the initial uh, application stage, the DFA rules requested that the site location map need to be extended to indicate control over lands required for engineering works necessary to provide a developed um, visibility space of 2.4 by 60. Uh, at recommendation stage, the, this information was not provided, uh, and therefore um, officers were not satisfied that, the, that this could be um, that the 2.4 by 60 meters was um, had, had been demonstrated that it meets policy AMP, AMP2 of PPS3. Um, you're aware that a lit item was received in relation to this application. Um, this was in the form of a an amended site location, uh, and we believe it was somewhat a bit applicant to address the, the rules concerns set out in the, the previous slide. Um, as stated, the rules are originally considered that it was not the, the red line was not sufficient to demonstrate the provision of 2.4 by 60. Um, they advised at a consultation stage that um, the provision of these plays to the southwest would require 55 meters of for party lands, which uh, would um, result uh, in engineering works as set out in the slide. Um, the amended plan um, has extended the red line as response to the roads. Um, though um, we would note that there's been no amendment to the P2 land ownership certificate. Uh, and there's no indication on the submitted site location, amended site location map that the applicant uh, has control over the lands to the southwest um, of the visibility space you leave the site. Um, if members were reminded to overturn um, the recommendation that today, road service would need to be reconsulted to determine the adequacy of these amendments and clarification would also need to be sought in terms of the, the P2 certificate, given the comments of road service and the original consultation response. So just the, the Show that in an image. The, the, the image on the left hand side was the originally submitted site location plan. Um, as you'll note, there's no visibility displays shown whatsoever. Uh, and then on the amended site location plan that we received on the, the 1st of March, um, visibility displays have been shown um, at the end of the laneway, both directions, those to the northeast um, appear to be within blue land, um, those are south. West is pointed out by roads um, appear to be in fur party land. Um, so those um we would certificate A is currently signed on the application. Um in addition to PPS3, we've also considered PPS2. Um upon site visit, um it was the, the view of the officers that there was given the, the nature of the proposal, i.e. it's a, a conversion of an old building and old um and the significant amount of vegetation on site, that this may be a site that would be um, potential ecological value or, or habitat for a protected species. Uh, and normally in such cases, we would require the submission of an ecological assessment and we would consult the, the relevant bodies such as NIEA. However, given that um, the officer, officer's recommendation that this did not meet the principle of development in the countryside, it was it was not requested as it was believed that it would be obligatory work and time consuming um, given the overarching policy allowing for residential development of this location had not been established. Um, officers have therefore taken a precautionary approach as consistent with PPS2 and have determined in the absence of any such reports, proposals contrary to PPS2. Um, 
So in, in summary, the refusal reasons are set out um, in the slide here. We have this contradict CTY1. Uh, there's no overriding reasons why the development should be located on the countryside. Um, as contrary to CTY4 and SPPS, um, in terms of conversion of a, a non residential building, um, it doesn't meet the requirements within those policies as set out. Um, it's contrary to AMP2 of PPS3, as it's not been demonstrated uh, at this stage that it will not prejudice the civility of convenience of road users. And as contrary to PPS um, 2 NH2, as it's not been demonstrated at this stage that the conversions and works associated would not have an adverse impact on the habitat of protected species. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Maggie. And I was remiss me at the beginning not to refer to the later information, the, the amended site location map, but um, Maggie's included it in his report. Um, at this stage, um, can I invite James Clark, uh, the address the committee? You're very welcome, James. Um, you've got five minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my wife and I bought the plot back in 2010. As we planned. As you know, the site <coughs> sorry, has a derelict building on which we've already got planning. For a replacement dwelling and the present application is for the old stone outhouses beside the main house but which include an old forge and we intend to enhance and develop this feature when we apply for full planning permission the idea is really because it's going to be our only neighbor we're going to keep this house for our kids we've studied the four refusal reasons and i'd just like to go through them Number three relates to road safety. And um, we've sent, since, as you see, sent in plans to show we can achieve the visibility displays required. We've also been in uh, contact with the landowner and there are no issues there at all. Um, point number four relates to habitat and natural heritage. An ecological appraisal was carried out by the um, uh, Canavan Associates in September, 2019. Point 1.3 of the report states that all of the outhouses have been included in the report's assessment. And in point eight, the conclusion of the report, it states there are no significant ecological constraints on the proposed development project on the site. Therefore, we would like to say that the point four is, is not valid. Uh, with regard to refusal points one and two, and they relate both to, to PPS, 21CTY4. Um, point A states that the building should be of a permanent construction. Well, the outhouses are, are made of stone. Uh, point B is the conversion should enhance the character and architectural features of the existing building. And this is, of course, exactly what we want to do with the old forge. Um, with point three, that's similar. Yes, we will certainly. Uh, design and sympathy with the existing buildings. And point D is to do with neighbours, but uh, there are no neighbours. The only close neighbours will be ourselves because uh, we're the closest house. The next closest house is the house that you saw on, on the diagrams there earlier, and that's more than 50 metres away. Uh, and you've got to go through our house to get to it. And then with regard to the main road, it's over 50 metres you know, down to the main road. So we would say we're not having any effect on anyone. Uh, plus the, the, the little track road that you saw there uh, going up beside the house, that abuts with the next farm where there are absolutely no houses. And, you know, uh, I don't think that, that, that there's any issues there with the farmer. Um, point E is that it uh, is not a, a applicable as it's residential. It's not non-residential. Point F, uh, services are avail available, particularly as we're building the main house next door. Um, and point G, uh, access to public road, that's already been addressed under point three. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time. I'll do my best to answer any questions you might have. 
Thank you, Mr. Clark. Members, is there any questions for James? No. Eric, can I? Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Had, uh, yeah, I had two uh, questions. One of them was in relation to um, the services, uh, but that's been answered. And the other is in relation to the degree of amplification uh, of the existing access onto the main road. Um, I suppose beyond uh, whatever works would, would be undertaken, What, how much more busy would that access be um, to a residential uh, property as it would be to a to, to sheds, I suppose that's the query. Well, um, I have three kids. <laughs> one's seven, one's nine, and one's 12. And, you know, we really are thinking of this house uh, for them for later. So for the first few years, there won't be anybody coming in anymore. It'll just be us going to our own house. And if you think of it, that house, we've got a over a one acre site there. And, you know, I, 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 we don't really want someone that close to us. So, uh, even though there's two half acre sites, um, we're quite happy to have, you know, uh, to keep this site for, for, for the kids. And okay, whenever they do use it, I mean, you know, it, it's only going to be two families rather than one. And I, I wouldn't say it's going to be a, a heavy car load. Uh, Senator Kelly, any questions? Chair, thank you. Okay. Is there any further questions for James? Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, move on now to questions to officer. Um, Councillor Gallagher has indicated you have a question for Malagi. Yes, uh, Chair. Thank you for listening. Just I have a point of credit, and maybe I might have picked this up wrong, but just in, in regards to uh, and I pulled up here just uh on the reasons for refusal just being point four and and uh if, if i'm listening correctly Margaret, did you say that that you didn't ask the applicant i uh, for any reports on the on the natural heritage of the impact i uh, and and i uh, just can't get my head around is if they won't ask for and sort because there was monetary value and, and time value that they wouldn't be considered because of other planning issues but but it's common here as an issue for refusal so it's up as an issue for refusal yet it wasn't sought so it, it, if, if my understands right it's it's nearly getting used against the applicant yet the applicant wasn't asked to provide it so I'm just wondering, would it, would it not be considered this maybe as part of a condition rather than being used as a part of a refusal? Just, just as a query, Chair. Malachi, well, do you want to address that? Um, yeah, for the Chair. Um, yeah, um, assessing the application, Council Yager, we um, have to take into account all the planning policies that are set before us. So on a submission of an application that's the same for the applicant. Um, so, you know, PPS2 is a relevant policy consideration in terms of uh, assessing the site in terms of uh, ecological value. Like, no, so normally you would get this information at the outset, a submission. Um, so if it wasn't included in the application and we were at assessment stage and the principle of the development um, in terms of the PPS21, um, was deemed not acceptable, so we didn't feel it was fair to ask the, age, uh, the applicant at that stage they they pay out you no know, for a survey if we felt that the, the if if the principle was not acceptable. You know we're we're making a recommendation at this stage, and you know as we know this is a decision for yourself. So you no, know, so it is open for yourself to the deal with that in terms of asking them if you were to overturn the principle address that issue. The reason we put on a refusal reason is that um, PPS2, when we're talking about protected species and stuff like that, it's uh, you, we're asked to take a precautionary approach. So if we can't at the recommendation stage say 
without any doubt that there's not going to there's not going to be an impact on protected species. And um, we take a precautionary approach and set forward a, a, a refusal reason. But you know, that can be addressed by the applicant through submission of the information. Thank you, Chair. So you can tell Paul. Yeah, just and, and, and so when we're doing our considerations, we consider element four as a possibility for down the road rather than now. And and but see when it's just see when you see it as number four, I can do an issue for refusal. It, it just sort of adds more weight to a refusal without saying, giving a fair balance to the applicant and saying, well, these, this condition could have been met. You know, and I appreciate 100% where markets come from saying around costs and all that. But what I'm saying is maybe we should consider that as a consideration rather than as an element to refuse. If that makes sense, Chair. Uh, uh, Sorry, Chair, I wonder if I come in there. Yeah, more going ahead. Sorry, just to clarify, members, you know, there will be reasons for refusal, and, you know, officers will be putting those in principle at the top of the list. Um, you know, it is our practice to bring forward applications as soon as they're ready, you know, when officers fail in principle in terms of policy matters that it, it has a recommendation for refusal in officers perspective, then there may be other issues outstanding within that list and they remain outstanding at the moment. And I think that's what Malachi is highlighting. It would be important and critical that, you know, that it's still acknowledged as an issue, um, but we couldn't deal with it by way of condition that we would have to have that information resolved before an application could issue, even if it was an overturn. So it's just important for me to highlight that. Thanks, Maura. Chair, can um, I come on just on Councillor Gellar's point? There, just on that slight point. I know I'm Council, sort of- Councillor Mooney, there's a few other people. Um, so that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll bring you in at the end. Um, Alderman Kerrigan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, hi, I was going on something similar. I was going through the refusal reasons there. And um, it was just the case of uh, maybe it's the history of the site or the history of it there. And not uh, should I maybe ask to the applicant in particular, but the applicant obviously owns the the old dwelling house, which Malachi has referred to there, which is on the same site or, you, you know, in the same area. It's, a, it's on the same site, but I know it's, it's the site that we're dealing with is separate from it. And these he referred to that these were potentially outbuildings from from the initial house. And, and I'm assuming then the applicant is seeking to develop the initial house for himself. And he has passed comment here that he's seeking to develop these these barns or the, the, these outbuildings here as a dwelling house for family members in the future, as as his intention here. Uh, I'm just wondering here, if he's submitted a habitat and, and natural heritage survey here, which took place in September 19, from my reading of what the applicant uh, had said, and that included all the, the main dwelling house and all other outbuildings on the site. Surely that, that he, he didn't just submit that for the crack he's, or, or get that done for the crack. He's obviously had to do that for maybe a, as an initial application in relation to the dwelling house to get planning permission. So, I mean, that's only in the region of 18 months old. So I would have thought that that, that documentation, which... I'm assuming planners have seen in relation to the initial application would would uh, would wipe out number four reason for refusal. I know maybe they don't just have it at hand, but it has, I'm assuming, been seen before. And again, I would have thought potentially as comments there in relation to the road access there and that late information that came in, maybe planners, as they haven't just got full time to take a look at it, that it would have the potential to remove the third application. Uh, I just put a query then in relation to the second application. I know they're looking there like like older outbuildings there, but the uh, uh, that the existing structure would not be deemed a locally important building, nor has it any ar architectural merit worthy of retention or upkeep. I would have thought like an old forge that would have been used in that area would have been something that could have been deemed as locally important, uh, as a locally important building. But, uh, you know, is there... 
maybe I suppose the planners don't have that information or on it being used as a forge, but maybe that's something that the applicant could have sought to uh, provide more information in relation to. So maybe maybe if there's a, there's kind of a question in there, something, Chair, I'm just wondering, in relation to the habitat report, does that knock out number four? The late information in regards to the roads, will that knock out number three, refusal reason? And would an old forge not be deemed as locally um, an important building, uh, potentially wiping out the second refusal reason? Just there's a few questions, Chair, this time. Thank you. Okay, no, thanks, Alderman Kerrigan. Maggie, do you want to pick up on that? Chair, thank you, Alderman Kerrigan. Um, yes, we'll just uh, um, we'll take those points one by one. Um, in relation to the the report, you know that that report wasn't submitted as part of this application, uh, and it's not it wasn't part of our consideration uh, as set before you today. Let know so it wasn't um, considered by the officers. Um, it was it was submitted. Um, in my understanding um, set out by the applicant in relation to a previous application. Yes, except it's very close by, uh, and uh, you know I can't dispute here. You know the, the points that he's made. Uh, what's within that report? So I, I think it is right that 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 is considered. You know, officers obviously doesn't have a chance to consider that on the recommendation. So it, it's it's a it's a bit material consideration for uh, today. Set before us that no, without having sight of it. In terms of the road. Yes, it's a lit item, and it's it certainly has been submitted the the address the roads considerations, and I think as I set out in my presentation, if um, members were of a um, of a of mind to uh, go against the officer recommendation, that is a, a matter that still needs to be resolved. Um, we have uh, you would need to consult the FA roads to to see if the the plans submitted are adequate. The Demonstrate that the 2.4 by 60 meters has been submitted, uh, and again, I think there would be some clarification. Although the applicant has says in his presentation to the neighbours' content, um, we normally in a planning application, suppose come back in some of the other previous presentation, um, we do need a, an accurate certificate of uh, um, P2 certificate on the application at present. It's saying it's certificate A, which means that the effectively that you know, all the land is in uh, the ownership of the the applicant, or he owns all his interest in all the lands. So he's clearly stated today that there's some of the land isn't in his ownership, so that would need to be addressed. Uh, and if that's the case under legislation, you can't make a decision uh, until uh, notice has been served on uh, the third party. And there's a requisite time for notice um, set out, so it's usually 14 days. Um, so again, um, maybe Philip or Suzanne could correct me, but I don't think a decision could be made without that being clarified. But the applicant uh, is clearly says that there is a third party and roads with the same belief. Uh, and again, in terms of the PPS 21, um, we this is the first that we've heard that it was a forge. Um, now we set out a report, you know, some case law in terms of what uh, interpretation of a locally important building. Um, you know, from visiting the site, it's it's not visible from the road. It doesn't seem to be any you know physical presence in the, the local landscape. Um, in terms of architectural merit, um, I think PAC consideration. They look at the, those factors then set out in the policy. I don't think it has any particular um, architectural merit. Um, so, I mean, uh, I mean, it's we have set out our view in terms of, of our consideration of what a locally important building is. That no, and again, the applicant has put on further information today for um, members to consider that no, so you can decide what width to give to the you know, that um, previous use. Thank you, Chair. Maggie, um, Maggie, just in, in respect to Alderman Kerrigan's first point, and I know you, you did address it, um, but see, and see, as part of um, an assessment on any application, see, see for the, the previous application or the application in, in the main dwelling house, 
Um, if, if, for instance, if we were requesting a bad survey, would a bad survey be applied to all outbuildings, or would it be um, contained within the the one uh, the one building um, that contained the, the application or the dwelling in question? I'm just I'm just trying to get my head around. Um, would there um, would there be information? Um, pertaining to this, um, or, or any potential bad, bad boosts and things like that, as part of the habitat assessment, would that be done um, as part of the main application, or the, as as the report that Alderman Kerrigan had alluded to? Uh, can, I, can I just come in there, uh, Chair? I, I, and that is that. You can't. That, that report. Yeah. Sorry. That that report did cover all the outbuildings for bats, as well. So we, we had the report cover both Mr. that Mr. and Mr. The Clark, Mr. Clark, apologies. I can't allow you to come back on. Um, oh, sorry. So sorry. Can you keep your, can you mute your mic? Absolutely. Um, Alderman Kerrigan, have you, are you content? I'm content, but uh, you, you know, um, Sorry, Chair. I, I, I am content at, at the minute there with the response, but it seems to me there may be a few more questions that would need to be asked and as well as additional information or I don't know, you, you know, not really saying that we, we maybe over uh, that we say yes or no or whatever. What is the, there may be a potential of, of giving, a, giving the applicant more time to get more information. I'm just not sure, but no, I'm content with Malachi's answers at present. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, and before I bring Councillor McKinney in, I'm going to bring Susanna in for clarity. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just want to clarify and, and just go on from what Malik is saying. In terms of the ecological ecology issues, okay, we, we're aware that that information was on the, on the previous outline, but it was not submitted with this application, and we cannot lift information off older files and bring them on to newer files. I would be advising the agent that any ecology assessment should be re-looked at again and updated. Uh, there's extensive advice on the DARA website as to the requirements of a preliminary ecological assessment and that anybody submitting an application for conversion or assessment should, should look at these before they're putting the, they're putting the information in. So this will need, in order to consider those preliminary ecological issues, and decide on whether we need a bat survey or not on it. In 2021, this will need looked at further by the agent, and information will have to be submitted on, 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 that, on that basis. Thanks. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, Councillor McKinney. Thank you for letting me in, Chair. Well, I was really just going to speak on uh, what uh, Keith has said and what Suzanne has come out with, really. You know, we, we need to maybe sort of think of uh, uh, deferring this to get a lot of more of the issues clarified. Um, uh, I don't really want to go back over stuff that's already been brought up, but uh, thank you for giving me the time to speak. Thanks. Um, Councillor Mooney, you, do you wish to speak? I know you've indicated your question's been asked. No, I'm fine. Yeah, it's actually, um, it's actually Alderman Kyrgyz's point about the report from Canavan Associates. Okay. That was clarified, so thank you. Thank you. Um, Alderman McClantic. Thanks, Chair. I want to leave the ecological studies for now, if I can go to something else. Maliki, um, under CTY4, I don't disagree with anything at all that you've said there about this being uh, not a suitable building, not locally important per state of repairs, no architectural textural merit. I get all that and I'm inclined to agree with you. I think this is quite a speculative um, application in this sense. But what I would like to ask you is the applicant said that he had, if I, I'm right, a one acre site. And did you refer um, to the fact that perhaps another an application for a different site within, within that land might be more acceptable. Um, and I wonder just, I, I didn't quite pick it up, just if you could elaborate on that, Malachi. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the chair. Um, thank you, Alderman Matonic and Contact. Um, yes, what I referred to um, was a, a previous approval for replacement dwelling uh, on the site. Um, it's the, it's, it's very much the same site in terms of the a former curtilage of a 
residential property. So there was a two story um, um, abandoned dwelling, which we approved for replacement. So I think the point that we the officer was making in the report was that um, there has been a development opportunity under CTY1, under PPS21 already uh, taken up by the applicant through that, if he implements that approval. Thank you, Chair. Alderman McCondick, is that you contend? Yes, thank you. I just just to absolutely clarify, it goes in my own head. So that has actually been that's something that the applicant can take up. Um, but this uh, this isn't you weren't referring to yet another application on the site, Malachi. Current application. Okay, members, there's there's quite a few of these have indicated in the chat box that you like the. Um, they, you would like to see a deferral in this application to allow the applicant the opportunity to, to provide the relevant information. Members, I know there's quite a few um, have indicated that. Um, I'm going to bring Councillor Boyle in to see if he, if, if you wish to. I need, I need a formal proposal if somebody wishes to, to take that approach. I'll propose the chair, Angela here. Chair, chair, I'm not sure who I'm not sure who put on the chat box first, but I think you know, in light of um some of the information coming our way, it probably would be uh, the first approach here to um sorry my iPad's playing up chair, wait a minute. Uh the first approach here would be to uh, afford the applicant an, an opportunity to give us that, that further information for our for our consideration. So I do propose that we have a deferral on this for now. I'll okay. second that, Chair. Thanks, Angela. Um, home by the chat box, everybody seems to be in agreement with that, that approach, but I'm going to just put it to the floor. Um, members, there's a proposal from Councillor Boyle, seconded by Councillor Dobbins. They defer, they defer this application. They um, allow the applicant the opportunity to provide um, the relevant information. So, members, I know um, in the past we have put time frames in in such deferrals. Is there is there any suggested time frame um, that we expect this application to come back by? Or sure, we'll bring. Can I ask Suzanne? Chair, um, chair, John here. Chair, chair. Yeah, I think. I was just going to say, Chair, I think a best suggested time would probably be from an officer perspective because uh, some of this takes time that perhaps we all don't know uh, how long it might take. So whatever, I think whatever our officers think might be reasonable, you know. Um, Chair, yeah. I would recommend probably three months the time to get an ecology report carried out. John, as proposer, are you content with that suggestion? That sounds okay to me, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, members. So there's a proposal from Councillor Boyle, seconded by Councillor Dobbins, to defer this application for three months for further information. Here. Um, who's that? Adam Kelly here. Councillor Kelly, go ahead. And just, uh, I'm, I'm picking up on what Planner said in relation to the ecology report, and um, she did mention. Uh, uh, bats previously, and I'm just conscious that the season for doing those, um, I think, doesn't start till later in the year. So I'm just wondering, is three months enough? I, I seem to recall May to September, but I may be wrong on that. Um, it'd be good if somebody could clarify that, um, because the opportunity for doing the report mightn't start for a couple of months, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, well, if, if members, I mean, the preliminary eco ecology assessment is really, it's a stage before that. Um, but if members want, we can, if the preliminary ecology eco oh, can't it, ecology assessment flags up bats as an issue, we will have to request a survey. So if members are content, we'll bring it back until we would get that information. And if Thanks, we Chair. receive no information within within the three months in terms of the preliminary info, uh, we'll bring it back just in terms of lack of information. With that, Chair, thank you. Okay, okay, I, I, 
Chair, could I just add, I'm sorry for not getting on the chat box, it's the typing, but it takes time. Um, uh, no, Councillor Kelly is quite correct, of course, to flag that up. Uh, and, and there must be a timeline and a time frame for doing this, you know. So, an all reasonable expectation, I think, is what we'd, we'd be asking for. Okay. Um, so, members, we've, we've deferred initially for a, a three month period, our proposal to defer initially for a three month period. Um, is there anybody? Can we take that as unanimous or is there anybody in disagreement? Okay, that's unanimous, members. Um, so that application has been deferred. Members, we've approached it to your mark. Um, I'm going to suggest we take a 10 minute break. So it's 10 past four now, and I'll um, see you back at 20 past four. Thanks, members.
Okay, and members, um, members, our next applications are as item, or as item number three and four, as you'll see on the screen. Um, we're going to take these two applications together. Um, but um, members, you'll be aware at the start that um, this application, there is a little information in respect to this. Um, it's a letter of support from the Theatres Trust. Members, I'm just going to ask you to take a few seconds now just to familiarise yourselves with um, the, the late information that's been submitted in, in respect to this application. Members content to proceed, or does anybody need more time? Okay. Um, I'm going to hand over to the Rosie. Okay, Rosie. Thank you, um, Chair. Will you take can us you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah. Um, can you take us through both applications? Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Good afternoon, members. Items three and four are applications for the alteration um, to existing building on 20 to 22 Hawkins Street involving the part removal of walls to facilitate internal reconfiguration and extension to the rear and the demolition of walls on the vacant site to the rear, which fronts onto Kennedy Place. So application LA 11 2020 850 DCA is seeking demolition consent as the site um, is within a conservation area and LA 11 2020 0844 F is for full planning permission to redevelop the site. The recommendation is to allow consent for demolition works and to grant planning permission for the proposed development. So this site shows, shows the application site and its context. There's an existing building on the site which fronts onto Hawking Street. And this is the existing Newgate Arts and Culture Centre. The remainder of the site to the rear um, is a vacant plot of land which was formerly occupied by two three-storey dwellings. And these were demolished in 2013 after having been derelict for some years. Supporting information submitted with the application states that the Newgate Arts and Culture Centre has a significant positive impact on the local community through the provision of services and activities, as well as improving the physical environment of the fountain area. The planning statement advises that the proposal is the culmination of extensive community consultation during the development of the Urban Villages Strategic Framework for Derry, Londonderry in 2016, and the preparation of the fountain area strategic overview in 2018. So the site is located within the central area boundary of the city and is within the historic city conservation area. The surrounding area is uh, predominantly characterised by housing at Kennedy Place and Kennedy Street to the west and Jack Allen Court to the rear of the site. There are two listed buildings, both Carlisle House and Good Templars House to the east of the site and Foyle Daycare is located opposite the site. Um, this side slide just shows the photographs of the existing buildings and the site in its context. So this is on the left is ha the Hawking Street elevation, the existing building. And the photograph on the right shows the building as it faces onto Hawking Street with the gap site to the rear. So before works um, can begin on site, there's a number of elements that require demolition. And because the site is within a conservation area, there's a requirement to receive demolition consent where there's unlisted buildings or structures. And these include walls and fences um, just as part of the planning process. In terms of the policy for consideration of demolition in conservation areas, um, the policy requirement is to preserve and enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area. And to achieve this, council will resist the total or substantial demolition of buildings where they make a positive contribution to the character of an area. The next slides here um, will just show the, that's sorry, just another slide of the rear of the building on Hawkins Street with the gap site in between. And this is the terrace of dwellings that continues down um, Kennedy Street. 
So the next slides are going to just show the extent of the demolition works that are required. This slide shows that the building, the existing building onto Hawkins Street, the front elevation remains um, as it is. And the uh, slide to the, le the right side with all the red um, hatched markings show the demolition works that are required to the rear of the building. And this is to allow the proposed extension to in with the existing building. This slide just shows um, the extent of the demolition works that are within the gap site. So you have this roller door and what's just basically hoarding at the minute onto Kennedy Street and a wall at the rear which faces into Jack Allen Court. Officers, um, oh, sorry, the next slide here just shows the internal works within the existing building then there's a bit of reconfiguration required within the existing building just as a part of the overall um, redevelopment of the site. Um, officers consider that the existing building on Hawkins Street makes a positive contribution to the character of the area and as it will be retained as part of the proposal there's no conflict with planning policy. The demolition to take place on the rear elevation is to allow the proposed extension to tie into the main building so again there's no concerns and the site to the rear along Kennedy Place has been vacant for some time, is unsightly and makes no contribution to the character or appearance of the area so the demolition of the walls and structures on the vacant site is considered acceptable. In terms of application LA 11 2020 for the redevelopment of the site, this um, redevelopment involves an extension to the rear of the site and reconfiguration of the existing building to provide three floors accommodating a performance space, multi-use space, art and tuition rooms, dance studio, offices, cafe and ancillary space and associated site works. These, this slide just shows the extension. This is the existing building on Hawking Street and the extension then as proposed to the rear that will tie in with the remainder of Kennedy Street. Um, the agent advises that the existing building will be retained and repaired in order to preserve the character of Hawk the Hawking Street elevation. And in respect of the extension proposed, it's considered that it's contemporary in design and form, and it's subservient to the main building on Hawking Street and is an appropriate scale in terms of the adjoining properties. The design approach is described by the architect as modern industrial, referencing the area's past and the nearby former shirt factory, now Carlisle House. The extension will be finished in high quality materials incorporating a specialist textured render system with a semi-smooth finish in dark grey and charcoal as a complementary contrast to defining the building's use as being different from the historic and residential buildings in the area. This combination of contemporary design and high quality material is essential in the site given its prominent location at the junction of Hawkins Street and Kennedy Place and within the conservation area and with views from the city wall. It's considered that the development is in sympathy with and enhances the form of the built um, form of the area and that the scale, form, materials and detailing of the proposed development respects the characteristics of the adjoining buildings in the area, including the listed buildings. Um, this elevation shows, uh, or these photographs just show then the rear elevation as it faces um, Jack Allen Court and it's opposite Carlisle House. And this, the bottom um, image just shows the, the uh, entire development in context with the remainder of Kennedy Place. In terms of the floor plans, um, We've got three floors and on the ground floor, this, this, pl this plan just shows the ground floor. We have the performance space in this location and to the front of the build, the, the front here is the, the building onto Hawkins Street and it will um, house uh, a welcome lobby, reception area and cafe. The first floor then has art, tuition and multi-purpose rooms within the retained building and the performance space at this is, is actually double height at this space or this on the second floor. And then on the third floor or second floor, I suppose you have the dance studio, which will be located along this portion of the building with a breakout roof terrace. Um, and then again, offices are within the retained building. Now, in terms of the representation, um, which in large provides um, support for the development um, and 
you'll have read in summary that what those uh, um, elements of support are, but there is a, a matter raised at the end of the letter in terms of accessibility, particularly for performers who are wheelchair users, and the suggestion that there be more than one changing of space that would be beneficial for the safeguarding of perf um, performers that are both children and young people. So just in terms of addressing those matters, um, there there is um, a lift that uh, serves all three floors of the building. So hopefully that will help with any internal accessibility. And if there's any requirement to provide a further dressing room, there is one dressing room proposed um, just um, outside the, the performance space, but there should be no problem really reconfiguring a room internally. It wouldn't require any specific further um, consent to achieve that. So this is the policy consideration in terms of new developments in conservation areas. And we've gone through a few of the, the bullet points at this stage. Um, there, in terms of then, uh, uh, sorry, in terms of the, the building and it, its design itself, there's also consideration has to be given to the impact on the setting of nearby listed buildings. The historic buildings unit was uh, consulted given the proximity to Carlisle House and Good Templars House. And they consider that um, as the bulk of the new building is within the gap along Kennedy Street, um, that there's no real impact on the setting of the listed buildings. What they've stated as they have considered that the listed buildings have sufficient presence to remain unaffected by the application. So officers consider that on the whole, um, the proposal complies with policy in that it makes a positive contribution to townscape, sensitive to the character of the surrounding area, respects the opportunities and constraints of the site and creates a new sense of place through sensitive design. You see from policy there that another element we have to give consideration to are problems such as noise um, nuisance or disturbance, so residential amenity considerations. So given that there is proximity of several residential dwellings in the immediate vicinity of the site, and given the use of the building to provide performance and dance spaces, residential amenity as a material consideration. However, we would note that uh, we haven't received any um, objections from any local residents. Main issues in terms of residential amenity would be overlooking noise and odour. In respect of overlooking, there's no residential properties immediately the opposite the site. Um, so overlooking isn't a problem from that perspective. Um, in Jack Allen Court, it's proposed that the rear elevation of the proposed building will be, it's a blank elevation to avoid any overlooking onto the properties in Jack Allen Court. So we consider that overlooking um, is not an issue with this proposal. In terms of noise, given the nature of the development, um, there is the potential to impact detrimentally on residential amenity. As noted, the ground floor accommodates a performance space. And then on the um, upper floor, there is a dance studio with a rooftop breakout area. So environmental health was considered uh, consulted and they considered a few uh, acoustic reports. Um, but on the basis of the information, um, provided, I mean that their main concerns were that there could be structural or airborne noise breakout on the residential property that adjoins um, the building. So given that particular uh, consideration was a, was a matter for them, but they've considered the acoustic reports and consider that there's, um, they're, ha they're content with con conditions to protect a residential amenity. Um, you'll see from the conditions proposed that these include a construction environmental management plan, restriction, restricting construction hours, um, restricting the hours during which performances and dance classes can happen to between the hours of 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. And there's uh, conditions then specifying noise limits above which um, plant and equipment and performance activities will not exceed. They also provide a condition which allows that within six weeks of the development becoming operational or following a receipt relating a receipt of a um, objection relating to noise that a noise verification report would be required. Odour would only be a problem given there's a cafe, but we're advised that it'll serve mainly tea, coffee, soup and sandwiches. So there really shouldn't be an odour issue from that and environmental health haven't raised a concern. The other issue then with this development was the potential for traffic impacts. Um, 
In respect of parking, the proposal has a requirement for approximately 47 parking spaces. However, the site does not provide dedicated parking and instead relies on the use of existing parking infrastructure in the area within public car parks on, on street areas and to serve the development. DFI roads have observed, however, that on-street parking is limited in the area and the existing on-street parking pressures in the area are well known. Um, I've just provided a slide here which basically looks at the, the, the policy that we would apply in respect of parking. So the site is within zone B, which is defined in the area plan as being with the, in the central area, but outside the commercial core. So in these cases, we give consideration to the nature of the development, the ability availability of existing parking both on and off street and other local circumstances. So in terms of the site itself, there's an existing community facility on site at present and it's accepted that the proposed extension will attract more users and therefore more cars to the site. There are existing parking pressures in the area, however, officers note that similar city centre uses such as the Playhouse and Millennium Forum do not have dedicated parking and instead rely on their city centre location and nearby paying car parks as well as alternative modes of transport. Um, in respect of the, this development, we note that the current peak time or the peak times for use of the building throughout the week are anticipated to be between 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. with the primary mode of transport being drop off or walking to the site by children. Um, on Fridays and Saturdays, with, when performances are taking place, the number of cars attending the centre increases to between 53 to 71, but performances are scheduled in the evening between 7 and 10.30 when there's likely to be more parking availability outside traditional office hours of 9 to 5. Um, in relation to spare parking capacity nearby, the agent has commented that the requirement for the existing facility at present is three to ten employee cars daily and this has already been accommodated on street and it's anticipated that the new facility will generate a requirement for 11 cars which represents one additional parking space over the current maximum requirements so any increase in parking requirement will be met by availing of any on street available parking um, capacity and an available uh, public car parks the travel plan states that measures can be implemented through a travel plan to reduce the prevalence of single um, occupancy car travel and these include managing use by encouraging car sharing, walking, cycling and public transport. Officers considered the development is highly accessible um, by public transport with six bus stops in the local area and there's also good availability or accessibility by walking and for cyclists. Um, policy also allows a degree of flexibility regarding parking where this would assist in the conservation of the built heritage and facilitate a better quality of development. Um, so the proposal does involve the reuse of an existing building, so it's considered that um, this part of the policy would be met. There's a service um, plan also proposed which will um, coordinate when deliveries arrive at the site to ensure that it avoids um, any obstructions of the local road or footway. DFI Roads commented that the service management plan and travel plan, if effectively managed, should mitigate the impact of these development and conditions requiring the finalised details of these plans is provided. Just in respect then of natural heritage issues, um, NIEA was consulted with a preliminary um, ecological appraisal and a BAT emergence survey, but N NED are cons uh, they're content that the, the site doesn't uh, support any priority habitat and there were no bats seen to emerge from the building on the site so they're con content that it's unlikely the, to currently support roosting bats. In conclusion then officers consider that the works will enhance the character and appearance of this part of the historic city conservation area through the reuse of an existing building and infilling of an unsightly gap in the streetscape within the conservation area. Approval is therefore recommended subject to the conditions set out in the planning report. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Um, members, is there any questions, the officer? No. Alderman McClintock. It's not actually a question, but if you're happy for me to move on to a proposal, I think this is a really innovative design. It's, it's just a great use of a derelict corner, a corner that is really unsightly at the minute. 
And I think the application certainly has a lot going for it. It's respecting the character of the whole um, Hawkins Street, sort of down to Horace Street, that area, and the new the new build uh, around that corner towards the fountain towards County Place, I think is really, really acceptable. Um, I think obviously the, the traffic is something that was an inner uh, city uh, building of this sort. There obviously are going to be issues, but as um, Rosemary has said, we have the Millennium Forum with other arts venues like the Playhouse. And to be fair, the, the time that these um, these uh, performances will take place will be outside of office hours. So therefore, there should be places uh, uh, available, I would think. So I would be very happy to propose um, both the, the two reports. I think um, it has everything going for it. It's great to see a derelict site like that coming up for such a new and imaginative and innovative design. And I think the fact that we have the contemporary and the, the traditional, it, uh, it's, really, it's, it's really excellent. So thank you, Chair. That's a proposal. Thanks, Alderman McClintock. Um... Can I bring Councillor Mellon in with a question? Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's just maybe more seeking a wee bit of clarity than a question. Um, you can see it as a good application, has a lot of mitigation within it um, to protect the residential area. And I know um, it has been said there has been no, no um, concerns raised by residents. But I'm just checking. I find it refreshing to hear. Um, if a, noise, if a noise complaint does come up, because that's probably one of the biggest parts of it, um, where residents close by, that they are protected when that comes forward, that that noise survey will take place. Isn't that right? Is that what I heard? Yeah. Yes, uh, Councillor Mellon, that is correct. At any okay. stage that there could be concerns raised by the by um, residents. Um, okay. There is the the applicant would then have to provide a noise verification report to demonstrate that noise is in with it within acceptable limits. Yeah. So we we would get the report and it would be forwarded to environmental health for assessment. That's great. Thank you, Rosemary. Thanks, um, Councillor Boy. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that Councillor Dobbins seemed to have indicated a, a question. Uh, I, anyway, uh, I see Councillor Kelly coming on the chat box there as well. Um, I, I'm obviously going to uh, support uh, the uh, recommendation to approve here, um, so uh, I, I'm content to be a seconder for that, Chair. Um, but I don't want to preempt the questions that others have here. Uh, so perhaps you can come back to me. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm going. To, I'm, I'm noting the fact that you've seconded a proposal that's on the floor, um, which you, you're entitled to do. Um, okay, Chair, Chair, can I yeah. just make a few comments in relation to it then, and, and yeah. then others okay. have, have their say? Would that be? Would that be? No. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, look, just just to keep it brief, Chair. You know, I mean, again. I think this is a very worthy uh, and welcome addition to the burgeoning arts and cultural uh, quarter that we're developing within the city centre. Um, uh, it's bringing a gap site uh, back into use. Uh, I don't know how many members of this committee will know this, but the gap site had for obviously formerly had a building on it, and the building actually was a synagogue. Uh, and uh, then subsequent to that, as I, as I understand it and understood it, it was the headquarters of the Ulster Unionist Party, no doubt, uh, in the city uh, at one time. And ironically enough, uh, you'll know this, Chair, I used to work across the street there in Carlyle House in, these, uh, in the, in the uh, Civil Service building. And uh, the building that is on the Gap site actually did collapse out under the street. And um, I was witness to it. So uh, it, it, it is, it is <clears throat> it's nice to see that there's an opportunity here uh, to create something new, something vibrant to provide for uh, communities right across the city. Uh, I might add as well, I look forward to it. Um, I think, uh, again, not to over egg the pudding, but it, it's, it's a first class development uh, and it's something I think that will add to the cultural offering that we have um, when we all come out of uh, the far end of what has been a very challenging uh, period in all of our lives. Um, so just to lend my support to it, Chair. 
you, Councillor Boyle. Um, Councillor Davins. Thanks, Chair. Um, and whilst I do <coughs> totally support this, and it, it is great, uh, even where it's situated, you know, in the, in the city, can I ask, would there be a possibility of, it's the constraint of um, working uh, between 7 and I think it's 11.30 or 11. Uh, Rosie, if you could correct me on that, can that be changed? Um, I'm just conscious that if you were living in the vicinity of something like this, it can be really um, noisy. <laughs> and uh, the last thing that you would like is whatever contemporary or popular music or whatever, you know, blasting through. Um, at seven o'clock in the morning, could that even be changed? You know, by an hour or an hour and a half. You know, either either way, if you know what I mean, a later start and an earlier ending. Councillor Jobbins is entirely within your remit to change those that condition and alter the times if um you would wish to do that. Seven a.m. Yes, to eleven. Mm. I think is the wording. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I, I see where you're coming from. So it's up to members if they want mm -hmm. to um, give consideration to amend that condition. Yeah, Chair, with that in mind, or with that um, uh, officers uh, <clears throat> coming back to me there, could I propose, if the, if the proposer and seconder um, would allow that, um, that maybe that condition be changed? You know, to a later time, you know, I think even eight o'clock in the morning is an early enough start, but it's uh, 11 o'clock at night. You know, most most places sort of finish around about 10, 30, 10 o'clock even. But um, with the permission uh, of the committee and the proposer, could we change that? Thanks, Chair. Sounds like I'm going to bring the proposer of the motion or the proposer of the of, of uh, the proposer and uh, the, the recommendation and uh, yeah. Alderman McClintock. Thanks, Chair. And I absolutely understand the early morning. I mean, seven o'clock, no one wants to have music or anything going on beside them at seven o'clock in the morning. So I would be certainly very much in agreement with that. However, I don't agree with uh, changing the time from 11 p.m. at night because on the occasional time when there would be a performance on, I think that's constricting the arts facility uh, too much. And I don't think it's going to be an every night to 11 p.m. So I would be happy to um, to, for officers to look at changing the start time, but I wouldn't like to consider the end time uh, finishing. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that, Alderman McClintock. Um, Councillor Kelly. Thanks, Chair. It's questions to, to satisfy my curiosity more than anything. Uh, one's in relation to uh, is there any visual or photographic um, or, or any sort of image of the, the site before the, the building that was um, that fell down or was demolished behind the, the current building? Is there any, because I think it would have been nice to have seen a representation of that, but it's, if it's not, it's, it's neither here nor there. It's more just a curiosity thing. And the other is I'm not, I'm not, um, I, I'm not sure that I buy the, the analogy with the, the the Millennium Forum uh, or the other one, because I don't know that the level of uh, residential impact is just the same uh, in terms of the locations. So I'm just wondering, where is the, the closest car park uh, to this development? Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Kelly. I'll come in first just on um, on your first query regarding photographs. Um, I know this might not be overly helpful at the minute, but there is both a planning statement and a design and access statement accompanying the application. And they show the previous buildings that were on the site. Um, if you wanted to have a wee look at those um, after the presentation, I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, good enough, thank you. Okay. Um, apologies, in respect of the car parking there there is parking on uh bishop street and the car parks at foil site Come on, on the there's parking. also sorry there's also a car park it's a public car park on carlisle road 
just just curious. It, it neither had any sort of determining factor in terms of the decision I'm taking, Chair, but it just was more for to satisfy my own curiosity. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Caitlin. Thanks, Rosie. Councillor Hergen. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, look, I, I, um, I, I think I'll be uh, voting the same way as everybody else in support of this proposal. I think uh, it's a great uplift for the building. And I've, I've spoken up there and that uh, I've been at meetings up there in the Northwest Cultural Partnership building. It's beautiful. Um, and this will be a welcome addition. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll see when we're back out going to live events and live meetings. Uh, we'll see it used like all the other venues across the city and district. Um, I do know, and I'm sure everybody else knows that the the fountain in that area around there uh, needs investment. There's a lot of lot of a lot of areas that are run down, uh, big gaps uh, that are actually dangerous and an eyesore, and it's been quite demoralising for residents around there. Um, I've spoken to quite a few residents that want to see uh, not, you know, want to see that entire area. Um, something done about it. So this 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 is a move in that direction that I think will be very much welcomed. Uh, and so uh, you know, it, it, like I'm looking forward to seeing this uh, progressed um, along the lines of parking. I mean, I'm sure everybody knows that uh, parking uh, up around the fountain and that broader vicinity is very very difficult, especially during the day. Um, and if more people are using this uh, expanded centre, um, that could become an issue. I don't think it's. Uh, I know that you've addressed that in your presentation. There's a question raised about it. I think it's a broader a broader issue about parking in the downtown areas. Uh, it's much easier to find parking around there in the evening, um, but it is a very residential area too. Uh, uh, you know, it buffers the the a kind of uh, city centre issue area. So I, I would have a slight concern about parking uh, for people, um, uh, you know, but very, very much welcome the proposal and, and it's a positive thing. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Harkin. Um, Councillor McKinney. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm fully support this. I think it's great to see investment in the Fountain area. <clears throat> which in parts can be quite run down. Uh, with regards to the parking, uh, yes, I would agree with what Sean said. It is a bit of a concern, and I'm sure Hilary would also back me up on that. The only, um, I know that uh, people uh, locally are complaining about people coming in and parking in and around their flats and all during the day, although uh, when they're trying to get park their vehicles and stuff, because uh, DFF has to put signs up telling people that they're not to park during this a residence. But there is a lot of waste ground there up beside the primary school. So uh, if that was to be used for parking, it'd be quite adequate. Thank you. Thanks. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, Philip, was there a question within that? My apologies, Christopher. No, not really. No, there wasn't. Hard. Just in case they end in relation to the primary school. but. Um, Members, is there any further comments or questions? No, um, just, a, just a few points. Members, uh, I note that Councillor Barr, um, Jason Barr, had indicated that he had technical dif difficulties and he, well, he must have started the presentation, so he wishes to record an abstention for both applications. Um, and I know there was a suggestion from Councillor Dobbins to amend the condition, which um, Alderman McClintic partially accepted. So, members, I need a wee bit of clarification on um, what the exact change in, of conditions were. Um, Councillor Dobbins, do you do you want to come on? Yes, Chair. Thank Angela, you. Um, no, I'm happy with what the proposer had said, um, in her agreement, albeit partial, that it be a later time of you know anyway starting you know eight o'clock even in the morning rather than seven, but I do take it on board that some performances or you know public performances may not be over until eleven. So if it was changed to eight until eleven then you know that um 
because if there was any unnecessary no noise, I'm sure further down the line, the noise abatement or the noise survey, you know, will deal with that. But um, eight to, to 11, I think, was what um, I had suggested. And I think Hillary had agreed to it. No, that's that's great. I just wanted that that final clarification. So, members, if there's nothing further, um, members, there's a proposal from Alderman McClintock, which has been seconded by Councillor Boyd. Um, and as as a way, as everybody in support of that application, they approve, apart from Councillor Jason Barr, who has indicated that he is abstaining. My question, Chair, do you need two proposals? Um, or do you yeah, need one? Uh, yeah, but I, I do. Um, and I know, well, I'd, I know I'd propose the second one then, Chair. Uh, and uh, Alderman McClintock had proposed the both. No, so I'm going to take the vote. All right, All right I'm going to okay, take the vote good. now in, in relation to item three, which is the, the full application, and which has been proposed by Alderman McClintock, which is seconded by Councillor Boyd. Um, is everybody all in favour, with the exception of Councillor Jason Barr? Yeah. Members, so that application has been approved. Um, the second one, I'm going to, um, I'm going to take a vote on the demolition consent item four. You need um, a proposal on that, chair. Alderman McClintock indicated that she was proposing both of those. Right. Um, then I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to come to yourself, Councillor Boy. Are you prepared to ex uh, uh, second? Of course, yes, of course. Yep. Thank you. Um, so, members, um, I'm going to assume that everybody's the same, or I'm going to I'm going to put it to the floor. Um, is everybody in support of the proposal, with the exception of Councillor Jason Barr? Happy with it, yeah. Thank you, members. Um, so that um, application has been approved. Both of those applications have been approved. Members, the next item on our uh, on our schedule is um, item seven, which is LA eleven twenty twenty one zero zero two seven. And it's a full application for uh, a side and rear extension. And it's Laura that's going to take us through that. It's at Eden Road Park in Derry. Over to you, Laura. Okay. Um, good evening, members. Um, so item seven on the agenda um, is an application for a side and rear extension. Um, along with alterations to the front elevation of Six Eden Road and Park and the recommendation as to approve. Um, so the site location plan and the aerial photo um, just show that the site's located on the countryside. Um, it's within the spare on A and B. It's a single story detached dwelling. Um, it's finished in rough cast render with a front and rear garden. Um, so this proposal um, was assessed under the dairy area plan, the SPPS, um, PPS 7 addendum, residential extensions and alterations. Um, the following photos just show um, some images of the site um, as it currently exists. Um, as I said, it's a single story dwelling. There's an existing detached um, single story garage. And this is just some views um, of the sites from the rear and from the side. Um, so these slide, this slide just shows the, the proposed plans. Um, as you can see, the majority of the extension um, is located to the, to the rear and to the side of the dwelling. Um, there are just some minor alterations um, to the front elevation um, there at the front windows. Um, so as I said, the proposal is considered um, primarily under PPS 7 addendum. 
Um, it's considered that the proposal complies with the policy in terms of the scale and design of the proposed development. Um, it's finished in sympathetic materials to match the existing um, building. Um, given the extent of the site, um, there's sufficient separation distance from any nearby residential properties. Um, there's sufficient um, distance or sufficient space left within the site um, for residential amenity of the residents of this property. And um, though the garage will be removed to facilitate um, part of the extension, um, there's sufficient space for parking again on the site. Um, there haven't been any objections to this um, proposal. Um, and therefore, um, approval is recommended um, subject to the conditions that set out in the report and just here on the slide as well. Okay, thank you, Laura. Members, um, any questions, comments? The officer? No, Jeff, you need a proposal. I'd propose that we proceed as yep. recommended. Thank you, Councillor Boyd. Second, Sean, right. um, we're spoiled for choice now. We've got a proposal from Councillor Boyd seconded. Um, the first person I heard was Councillor McKinney. Um, before I take it to vote, members, is there any? Is there any? Anybody wants to comment or raise a question? So members, just, that's uh, Councillor Gallagher. Just go ahead. Just I, and it's just just a, a point from from my good self and my my experience of planning. Do you see this this application wouldn't have normally came forward to the planning, uh, and and the sense of just this being an officer that's employed by council is the only reason this came forward. And, and this would normally have been approved. You know, that we met all the criteria and. No objections, no rest. So it was actually under the threshold of such of coming for committee. That would that be my understanding, but yeah, no, that's that, that's that's a hundred percent right, Councillor Gellher. And it was remiss of me not for not to highlight that at, at one stage because it is a relatively straightforward application that wouldn't normally um, come before the committee. And the only reason why it is is because it's I'm a council officer. Is applicant so chair could, chair could i also add to that that, that i'm the same stance for uh council elected council members as well um and that any application comes forward from anybody who works for the council or who is elected to the council um this is standard procedure yeah um members we have a proposal from councillor boy um the second the big councillor mckinney there's no further comments i'm going to Take a vote. Um, is there anybody with a difference of opinion, or is that unanimous? Okay. I'm going to take that as unanimous. Um, so we're moving on now to your last application, and it's up item nine. It's LA 11 2027. And it's a proposed new visitor center at Everington Square. And it's at Malagi that's taking us through this. Over to you, Malagi. Thank you, Chair. Um, LA 11, 2020, 0887. It's a full application for a proposed new bald visitor center. Uh, it's an extension to the current building at Lancaster Rear and including 70 uh, Everington Square. Dairy. Um, the property is known as a Wall City Brewery, and the recommendation is to approve. Um, the site is located uh, in the Baldwin current to the rear of the Baldwin currently used as a Wall City Brewery, which has a, a west facing elevation onto the parade ground. Um, for those who are familiar with the site, um, it's, it's outlined in red, um, and the proposed uh, additional build is to the rear. Um, at the other side from the parade ground. Um, here's the existing and proposed site plans. The, this is the existing Wall Saturday Brewery restaurant. Uh, and as you see in the image on the right, this is the proposed building, which is, uh, I suppose it mirrors in terms of scale 
in footprint to the, the existing building and there is a, a courtyard between the existing building and the proposed uh, additional uh, build. Um, the proposed floor plans are set before you. Um, they set out a number of proposed um, new uses, um, which are complementary to the existing restaurant and microbrewery, um, which exists at Wall City Brewery. Um, there's a, an additional brewing and distilling section. Um, there's a space for hosting um, groups. Um, Wall City Brewery have uh, already on record of, um, suppose, the, the sort of food tourism, uh, where they bring groups in and uh, they'll use this main area here in the middle. And there's taps and there's also a reception uh, and a small gift shop, um, as well as some other, you know, uh, Part of facilities, etc. Um, the proposed elevations here is to say, let me know that's the, the the main elevation internal in the courtyard at the top, so it'll fit under the existing building, uh, where the the bottom elevation will fit um, up towards what would have been the former officers' mess with an Edmonton, but it's uh, at a lower level than that. Um, probably these computer uh, generated images would give you a better idea of the. The design and scale of the building that now it has a hopped roof uh, and they match the existing or sorry they, they mirror the existing. Um, it has a, a grey roof finish, but with a more modern material again uh, picking up from the the existing building, and uh, it's going for a more modern finish in terms of the elevations with a black timber slatted uh, finish uh, and. Um, I suppose it's just important to note as well, whilst there is a lot of listed buildings within uh, the Abington setting, um, the, the existing Wall City Brewery building is not listed, um, whilst the, the building to the rear, which I pointed out, the officer's mess um, would be listed, and the other buildings, such as a clock tower uh, on the parade ground, would be listed buildings. And there's also uh, the site that's um, adjacent to the, the Schedule monument, which is the, the star fort um, of an Ebrington. So, a policy context is set out there before you. You know, you have the area plan, SPPS, uh, PPS free. Um, probably the main considerations in this application would be PPS 6 in terms of uh, the impact on uh, the schedule monument and the effect on the setting of listed buildings. Uh, and we also have PPS 16 in uh, relation to tourism and the dairy area plan, but also have tourism policies. Um, as part of the consideration of this application, we consulted a number of uh, statutory bodies, um, not least uh, historic buildings and historic monuments. Um, both have considered the proposal or content. Um, uh, historic buildings um, see no impact on the setting of listed buildings. Historic monuments are content uh, subject to the standard condition of the archaeological works um, as per P policy BH4. Um, NA water, roads, and environmental health, and, uh, no objection, subject to standard conditions and informatives. Um, I suppose, in summary, the, 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 ball, the, the existing building is not lasted, like as I say, it's close proximity to the Everton Square and the Schedule Monument. Um, these have been considered and uh, by the statutory bodies and by officers, and it's um, there's no uh, issue in our uh, in our view in terms of the uh, impact on those acknowledged areas. Um, it's set within a mixed use area in terms of residential amenity, etc. There, there is no proposed or existing residential residential properties close by, so it's a complement and very much the the restaurant that's there and. Uh, um, will be complementary with the other sort of uses in the area, which are mainly offices, etc. Um, the, the, the use of the Bolton 7 is well established under a previous approval. But the same materials are um, modern, but they're considered acceptable uh, at this site. Um, you know, the, the, the views of it, you know, uh, will be mainly from the rear or internally in the courtyard. Uh, and again, HED had no issues in terms of. Uh, Impact of materials on listed buildings, etc. So we, we think it's a, just a welcome addition. It's sort of uh, it's a stuffer and a complements the existing building. 
Uh, and overall, in terms of tourism policy, we see this as a positive uh, addition to Edmonton and the city. Um, it's, it meets the relevant tourism policies and will um, hopefully increase footfall in the area and it gives more capacity for the operator to, 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 to carry out you know, some of the, um, the work they've already been doing. Um, so it's compliant with tourism policy in that respect. So overall, um, it's the, we believe it meets all the relevant pol plan of policy. There's no objections. All consultees are, cons are content and we would recommend uh, approval on this application. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Maggie. Members, any questions, comments? No. I just want to give you some time to work the chat box. No, um, Councillor McKinney. I'm not okay. Thanks for uh, doing that for us. <clears throat> Is there any photographs of what the view would be from the parade square? Just to see, uh, I don't think you can see it, but you wouldn't be able to see the new proposal, you know, the building from the parade square, would you? Or is it just would you just see the front edge of the existing building? Chair, um, Councillor McKinney, I, I mean, it's of a similar scale uh, um, to the existing building. There may be some you no know, fleeting views, you no know, from particular angles as you walk along the parade ground, but you know, very much it's not going to be bigger than the existing building. So the existing building would very much screen it. Um, or in sort of fleeting views from angles. Um, there are some images within the Vainac Testament, some are the, the, the presentation earlier, let me know, um, which is on the, the planning portal if you, if you want to look at those. But um, we, we assess it, we don't think there would be uh, much of a, a visual impact from the square. I'll do great. Thank Thanks you, very much for that. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks, Phil. But I think it's fair to say that it, it, it certainly won't be prominent. Um, it won't be a prominent feature in, in respect of the, the square itself. Alderman McClenty. Chair, I'm looking again at the, the lack of questions. I mean, I think this is a good addition to the Everton site. Um, I think it complements what's already there, and I think it will bring much needed tourism and footfall to the area. So without wanting to stifle questions, I would be happy to propose the acceptance of the officer's report. Thank you. Happy second, Chair. Second to be Councillor Money. Um, any any other comments, members? Uh, I know. Um, just just as a supplement, the um, Alderman McClintock's comments. I know. Everton Square has been identified by this committee for a long time as as an area of strategic importance. Um, they are city and district, and this is this is another step forward in terms of the development of Everton Square and. Um, I, I, it's in my opinion um, when you look at the application that was put in front of us today it is respectful and it's in keeping with the the surroundings all, um, and the list of buildings that that, that are nearby um, so um, I, I, I would attend there I would be full in full agreement with the proposal made by Alderman McClintock but as we when we move on we take that day a vote. So we have a proposal from Alderman McClintock, seconded by Councillor Mooney, to accept the officer's recommendation to approve. Um, is there anybody who disagrees with that or can I take it as unanimous? That's unanimous, members. Thank you. And that concludes the applications. And, and today's business. So I'm going to move on now to item nine, which is a request to change the date of the April planning committee meeting. And I'm going to hand this over to Emma Malloy. Uh, okay. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, members. Uh, members, this is just a very brief report to, as the chair said, to request a change in the date of the meeting of the April Planning Committee. Um, as members will appreciate, uh, there's potential clash due to the public holidays. And um, if we uh, remain with the date of the 7th of April, there's the potential that the business of the, the committee could be impacted. And um, oh, perhaps. Please. Sorry. Okay, I didn't. I didn't catch it. I just I, somebody said so proposed, but I didn't catch who it was. Which I didn't mean to kind of. It's it's just a procedural thing, and I don't think we need the full report to stand here. Uh, I'm happy to propose it. Okay, thanks, Councillor Kelly. Is there is there anybody? Second. Councillor Councillor Gallagher second that. Um, as as Councillor Kelly outlined, I know it's it is a procedural thing, and it, and it's it, it's fallen to the timings of with the public holidays, the days that the public holidays have fallen on. So we're all in agreement that that the April's committee meeting is going to um, will be moved um, to the following Monday. Um, everybody happy with that? Yeah. Um, members, as a as I mentioned earlier, um, item number thirteen, which is which had been open for information, um, has been moved out um, for open for decision, and it's it's again it's in relation to Everton, the Everton DFA consultation, um, and I'm going to ask Suzanne to give us a brief overview of that paper. Suzanne, okay, thanks, Chair. Um, okay, members, as you've seen in the, in the pack, we have received a consultation from DFI on a current reserve matters proposal they're dealing with for Building 40. Um, and because this is in, in the outline was um, of was was reasonably significant, I suppose, they're dealing with the reserve matters on, on the case. Council, as you'll see from my brief report, is currently dealing with the list of building consent. But in any case, the application at the minute is for the alteration extension of the former military building to provide a bar, restaurant, landscape and associated works. What's happened here is amended plans have been submitted in terms of the reserve matters. Um, and they basically are to do with the smoking area uh, and the location of it um, and ducting and vents in terms of the positioning, in terms of residential amenity, number of changes in terms of glass doors. Um, and the P1 form was amended to show the space differences from upstairs. Incidentally, all these plans have already come in to our list of building consent and have been um, reviewed and approved by HED. Um, so basically, as officers, we would have no issue with um, the revised plans. And indeed, our officers have been involved in, in meetings with uh, DFI and the consultees and the agents in terms of bringing both proposals along at roughly the same time. So it's just really to update you that amended plans have come in. Uh, under, under procedure, um, there is a requirement to notify the council and the chief executive. Um, and it's, I suppose, incumbent on the bus then just to provide a response. So officers' recommendation would be that there's no no objections, and, and we could um, complete that via the, the government portal. Happy to take any queries. Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks, Suzanne. Any questions, members? Okay. Councillor Boyle, um, as indicated in the chat box, that he's content. Um, can I take that as a proposal? And on date? Yeah, we present it. And happy second chair. Yeah, um, kind of seconded by Councillor Kelly. Um, members, is there any further comments? No. Um, members, take that as unanimous. We'll proceed in that business. Members, items number 10, 11, 12, and 14 are open for information. I'm going to go through them um, one at a time. Is there any comments or questions in relation to item 10? 
just come in with a generic query on that. Yeah. I'm just I'm just wondering what uh, what the difference is between um, an appeal that's upheld and appeal that's allowed. I wonder if somebody just maybe clarify that for me. Okay, thanks to the chair. Um, I think this is in relation to if it's an enforcement appeal. Um, the, it means the enforcement notice is upheld. Okay. Uh, which means, as a council, we have we have been successful in terms of an appeal being allowed. Then, obviously, then um, the appellant will have been successful in that. So, I think I the, another query came through on this as well. I've amended that, uh, Councillor Kelly, in terms of the enforcement notice appeals. Just just in terms of clarification. Thanks, Chair. Um, any any further comments in relation to the appeals? Chair, just to maybe update members that since the paper was um, sent through to the committee team, uh, we have received a claim for costs in relation to two ongoing appeals, number 36 and 37 on your appeal schedule. Those relates to two wind turbines that, that we refused back in July. Um, so those claims of for costs have just come in and myself and um, the solicitor will be drafting a response to PAC on that and we'll keep you updated. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to, Maura, do you want to come in and, and in relation to the costs? Chair, sorry, no, I have nothing further to add. It was just okay. I wanted to make sure our members were aware. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thanks, Mark. Um, members, I'm going to move on now to item 11. Um, it's an onboard Panala decision. Can we take that as read? Are members, any comments or questions? Okay, I'm going to take that as read, members. Here. Councillor McGuire. Yeah, that's the mean bog one, Cherry. Sorry, I had it. I was on yeah. for a second, is it? No, uh, the Barnsmore. Yeah, the Barnsmore. Yeah, yeah, Cherry, just uh, I think I would have to put on record that uh, I find it bizarre that this would go ahead after recent events uh, in relation to the mean bog landslide. Um, and I just want to put that on record and to say that uh, I, I would strongly disagree with that decision, Chair. Okay, um, those a point will be noted. Um, any further comments, members? Let me move on now to the enforcement review. And I'm going to, I'm going to invite here. Um, just, are you, I'll bring more on first, just to give a brief um, overview in, in relation to the enforcement review. And a rationale for um, why we've why we've got a, a a review in front of us in today's meeting. Thank you, Chair. Um, members, just a reminder: um, as part of our enforcement strategy, um, we are required to update the planning committee every quarter. So this is our quarterly report, and um, Karen's going to obviously update, but available for questions as well. Thank you. Okay, members, it is it is in for information, uh, and I don't expect Kieran to go through the report. I'm going. Kieran's available for questions. If members have any, could I ask one? Sorry, I didn't get in the box. Yeah, I'm going ahead. All the members um, have Yeah. Can I just check with Kieran? Does that include um, enforcement for all these advertising hoardings that are absolutely all round our? Certainly around our city at the moment. I mean, they seem to just be popping up absolutely everywhere. So, do, are, do the numbers uh, on the reports appear and um, would they include those? And where are we with things like those? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, Councillor McClendock, we do we do have quite a lot of those um, cases at the minute, and we are working through them. Um, we're getting ones closed, um, but as quick as we're getting them closed, we're getting new cases opened on them. We're getting quite a lot reported at the minute. Um, so officers are are working through them, getting them, and we do have within the town and the, the district in particular, we do have our hotspots where it's it's almost perpetual cases. As quick as we get them closed, somebody sees a, a free space again, 
and they're they're open again. So um, we are we do have them. We are working through them. Um, and in terms of those, they are a direct offence. If we have any that are particularly stickier, we can't get rid of. They will be coming direct to committee then for a summons. Um, we we don't have to serve a notice on them. So any that we do have, we will bring forward. But we are we are aware of a lot of them. And if there's any more that anybody's concerned about, they can report them to us. And we'll get a case open and get an investigation started. Okay, thanks, Kieran. Right. Um, Councillor Boy. Thanks, Chair. And allied to that, Kieran, um, uh, when Hillary is referring to various advertising holdings, uh, what is the situation with constituted political parties who are also um, uh, potentially in contravention of uh, the same guidelines? Um, uh, are, are, are they being pursued or can they be pursued? And I'm not naming any names at this point, but I think um, we're all driving around and we can all see. And I'm not asking you to comment on that, Kieran. Uh, through the chair again, in relation to political parties, there are PD rights, which relate to election posters and uh, things like that. Um, if there are other posters around or advertising, um, hoardings up, if, if we have them or they're reported to us, we will get a look at them, um, if anybody has any. Well, Chair, through you, I could write you out a very long list, Kieran. I may well have to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. John, I can give you a pair of scissors. Yeah. Um, Chair, maybe yeah, some people should declare an interest. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely. I don't even want to get, out, go on, get into the, the subject of, of posters. Um, but... Um, and remaining on the, on the issue of enforcement, is there any further comments um, for Kieran? No. Um, members, moving on now, is there any comments in relation to the list of decisions issued for February 2021? No. Members can have a proposal. A proposal to go into confidential. Opposed, Jason Barr. I have seconded. I'll okay. Can I get confirmation that we're on confidential? 